Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. All right, Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the masses. Today's Monday, May 8th, 127 days into the new year, just 238 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California, and I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world. All across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I am your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? Happy Monday. we got a great week lined up in front of us. A couple little hiccups here. It's all digital, man. It's a digital world we live in. It's all good. Tonight, tonight we have Michael Schratt with us for the first time. And we're going to go full UFO all night long. We're going to go UFO all week long, actually. Tomorrow night, Peter Lavenda is here. Tomorrow night, Peter is going to talk about the 100th anniversary of Fatima. Yeah, can you believe it? It's been 100 years. Wednesday night is author R.D. Gennari. Thursday night is another Fader Night with John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom Live, followed by open lines all night long. Friday night, I'll be over at Coast to Coast, hosting over there. My guest will be Stephen Greer. Saturday night, I'll be over at Coast to Coast. My guest will be Peter Lavenda for the actual 100th anniversary of Fatima. That will be Saturday, May 13th. Yeah, May 13th, 1917. It's been 100 years. So that's it. Got a full week in front of us, no days off. It's going to be just a fun week, all UFOs all the time. All week, all week, all week, seven days. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. Everything is fade to black, uh, J Church Radio. Oh, uh, yeah, Thursday night. Actually, we're taking off. Thursday night will be a best of replay. We're going to do a Trisha Eastman. It's up on the website. All right. And now go follow, like, and subscribe. Go over to Jimmy Church Radio. Click on those tiny little buttons right there. The Sandbox. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. The Sandbox is hashtag F2B on Twitter in TweetDeck. Get yourself TweetDeck. We're going to uh, bust through a few thousand tweets tonight. Come over and hang out with us and join the conversation any questions for myself or our guest tonight, Michael Schratt, it's hashtag F2BQ. You can email throughout the show. That will be jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Now, uh, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Uh, go over to the website. If you if a podcast is what you desire, we have all the software you need. Just go to the iTunes store. Go to the Google store. Search Fade to Black. Download the app. Go to Libsyn. $2 a month. Or you can become a member. Uh, go to our membership section. We're going to upgrade the, uh, the membership section over the next few days to allow gift subscriptions and upgrades and some other things. So that'll all be there on our website. Um, uh, be, become a member. Every month we give away a really cool prize. And that's it. No no purchase required. Just become a fade or not. Or you can go down and all the way to the Game Changer where you will get an autographed hat and T-shirt, and you get downloadable archives, and you get the bunker cam every night. And uh, so that's in our membership area, okay? This month, uh, we'll be giving away a coffee bar, full-on, all the hardware that you need, and coffee to make the best cup of fade-to-black blend every single day. So that's going to be our package this month. 
Go now and become a member in our membership area. Do check out all of our sponsors, Life Change Tea, GetTheTea.com, River Moon Coffee, Studio Dome Speakers, and all of our advertisers on the show. Use the promo codes for discounts and free shipping. Everything are in the banners over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Now, next week, we will be at Joshua Tree, California for Contact in the Desert next week. Can you believe it? Unbelievable. May 19th through the 22nd, Joshua Tree, California. We're going to be hosting three events over the weekend. Friday night, of course, Fade to Black is broadcasting live. Saturday night, Sunday night, I'll be hosting panels uh, at 7 p.m. in the amphitheater. Uh, I, I want to remind everybody that Friday night, Caroline Corey is going to debut her film, Gods Among Us, in the amphitheater right after Fade to Black. Okay, so there you go. What a great weekend that we've got lined up. Now, uh, and that's next week. Uh, tickets and info over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. We will be at East City Ranch for the July 4th weekend conference up at East City. And uh, tickets and info over at org. All right. Let's get the show cracking. Happy birthday to today. Enrique Iglesias today is 42 years old. You know, and he makes the cut. 100 million albums, by the way, he has sold worldwide. He makes the cut because what was the film he did with Antonio Banderas? Ah, oh, where he played the assassin. He was so good in that. Anyway, also our dead guy's birthday today is Don Rickles. 1926-2017 uh, legendary insult comedian who was a frequent guest on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and of course, the Dean Martin celebrity roast specials that we all know and love from our childhood. But he was also Mr. Potato Head in the three Toy Story films, if you didn't know that. He died last month at the age of 90. Happy birthday today to Don Rickles. On this day in history, OTD, 1945. That's right. Victory in Europe Day was on this day, May 8th, 1945. Fader fact. There are nearly 1,400 known asteroids, known asteroids capable of causing major devastation if they hit planet Earth. That is a fader fact. Now, how many that we don't know, right? All right, tonight our guest is Michael Schratt. First time on the show. Michael, a lot like Richard Dolan. Michael is the guy out there that, uh, you know, his presentations and his thorough research into history and black ops and aircraft and triangles and underground bases and above ground bases, um, his, his knowledge is it's a, extraordinary. And he is one of the stars in, in, in Greer's new film, Unacknowledged, great pre pre presenter in the film. But tonight is the first time he's on the show, and I cannot wait to get the questions asked of him. So that's tonight. Tomorrow night, Peter Lavenda is here. Wednesday night, R.D. Gennari. He's an author. And uh, Thursday night, we're taking the night off. Uh, we have an engagement that we are going to go and do. And then Friday night, I'm over a coast. And Saturday, I'm over a coast. Now, uh, Shrat is with us tonight. Over the weekend... The X-37B landed after uh, two years in orbit, secret space plane of the Air Force. What is it doing up there? It just landed. It landed for the first time on the East Coast. It's always landed out here in the Mojave, but uh, it landed for the first time on the East Coast. And they've been preparing that for years for this landing out there. But what is it doing up there when... when the secret space program is talked about, and a lot of people are talking about it today. There's a lot of disinformation out there about it. And the secret space program, if you want to know of it in its official capacity, right there, the X-37B. We know nothing about the X-37B. We don't know what it's doing up there. Uh, is it dealing with... Uh, uh, weaponized satellites? Is it spying? Is it? Does it have camp? We don't know anything about the X-37B. That's because it's part of a secret space program. So if anybody ever comes up to you and says, man, you know, there is, yes, there is. The X-37B is part of what we know about about a secret space program. We're going to talk about that tonight with Michael Schratt. But the disinformation that is out there when it comes to the secret space program, we have a lot of 
whistleblowers. We have a lot of uh, uh, people that have been part of the real space program, speaking about a parallel space program that has gone on in the background over the years. We have so many uh, black operations and black budget Pentagon uh, projects that are going on that we don't know where this money is has disappeared to, right? And this is what we need to do. And Michael is certainly part of this is we need to have a united front. We don't need to have this person or this per- or, uh, you know talking about each other or or the audience picking sides. That's not what we need. What we need is to listen to everybody. Tonight Michael Schrat is part of that. We need to listen to everybody. We need to push everything into the middle of the table. Tonight uh, or next week is contact in the desert. And again, a bunch of different views on a very touchy subject. And we need to listen to everybody. The infighting that goes on, it just it just rubs me the wrong way. I'm not happy about any of it. And I'll tell you something else. It doesn't uh, only include UFOs in the secret space program, right? It's Egyptology. It's 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 Peru. It's lost civilizations. It's it's North America. It's Asia, everywhere, right? We just need to have a general united front, and I will be at the center of all of it. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be right back after this break with our guest, Michael Schrat. Stay with us. Listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black. You create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Hi folks, let's wind the clocks back 60 years. Food was different. Food provided health and nutrition, and using supplements was minimal. Unfortunately, now we have chemicals, GMOs, herbicides, and pesticides that can be quite lethal in the name of our food supply and, of course, the ever-loving dollar. Supplementing our diets can be very important to stay healthy. Cleansing from daily intruders to the body might be critical. Live strong and take charge. Log on to GetTheTea.com. Our herbal tea is a great way to cleanse from intruders. Our supplements is a great way to maintain and improve your health. When your health is not up to par, go to GetTheTea.com. No GMOs, no fillers, and organic. And very helpful in keeping you at the top of your game. Life is too short to feel, uh, you know what I mean. Stay in the game, at the top of your game, with GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Again, GetTheTea.com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Klutzke with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station where the Fader Knots rock. 
Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. Tonight, Michael Schratt is with us for the first time. We're going to go full UFO all night tonight, as we will all week, because tomorrow night, our guest is Peter Lavenda. Wednesday night, author R.D. Gennari is here. So, full. And then uh, Friday and Saturday, I'm over at Coast with uh, Stephen Greer and again with uh, Peter Lavenda. So, Great week lined up for everybody. Tonight, Michael Schrapp. He is a private pilot, military aerospace historian, and has lectured across the country on the unique subject of mystery aircraft and classified propulsion systems buried deep within the military-industrial complex. A guest speaker at the Oshkosh Air Venture 2006 and 7 event, the world's largest air show, by the way, Michael has developed a number of contacts which have had firsthand experience dealing with classified black programs, including former USAF pilot retired naval personnel and aerospace engineers that have maintained a top secret SCI security clearance. Michael currently works as a solid works draftsman in Phoenix, Arizona. In an effort to expose government fraud, waste, and abuse, Michael devotes much of his free time researching aerospace technical documents, conducting interviews, and traveling to multiple university archives. As a concerned citizen, it is his belief that it is our constitutional obligation to question authority and demand accounting of unacknowledged special access programs that bypass congressional oversight and public scrutiny to the tune of about $13 trillion. I would like to welcome, for the first time to Fade to Black, Mr. Michael Schratt. Michael, good evening. Good evening, Jimmy. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to be on the program. Oh, man. The the honor is all mine, uh, my friend. But this is, uh, we kick it off. Whenever we have a first-time guest, you get the first-time guest disclaimer. Next time you're on the show, you're not going to get it, but you get it tonight. And that disclaimer is this. It's just you and I sitting on my couch talking as friends. Where we start, we start. Where we end, we end. But we're going to end as friends. There you go. Are you ready? Okay. That sounds good. That yeah. sounds fine. You're not intimidated, are you? No, that's okay. <laughs> um, I, I want to start here before I, I want to you know, talk about how you got into this, of course. But I want to start here. You, um, I look at you like I look at Richard Dolan or John Greenwald, where you guys represent us. When somebody comes up and says, man, you guys are a bunch of tinfoil hat, crazy, you know, I go, well, we we got Michael Schratt, right? <laughs> you you represent us in a very straightforward documentarian, historian uh, type of way. And with that comes a little bit of pressure. Do you feel that pressure that you are representing us <laughs> as the straight guy? Um, not really, because what I've tried to do is I've tried to track my sources, and I always back it up with either an Aviation Week Space Technology article, a Jane's Defense Weekly article, or something that was stated by a Lockheed Skunk Works engineer under the direction of Ben Rich. And so that's kind of the mandate that I followed. And 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 you are, when you look around the room, you, you speak at a lot of events. And you look around the room, um, do you feel that there is a generation gap out there? Or do you think that we're, you know, still pulling up, you know, the younger generations into our little community and we're keeping the information and the knowledge flowing? Um, the only way I could respond to that is that the the research that I follow is a very finite, laser-focused part of ufology, the tracking down and the exposure of these classified, unacknowledged special access programs, specifically the aerospace vehicles from the what's called the aerospace alley, going from San Diego all the way up to Los Angeles, heading north toward Lancaster, Palmdale, and then ending up at Edwards Air Force Base. So that's the corridor that I focus in on. And so it's just a very laser precision fine-tuned area of research 
And do you have, uh, do you have, uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up, do you feel that the younger generation, one's younger than you and I, right? Uh, do they contact you too as well? And uh, are they feeding you information and, uh, you know, and do they follow what you do? I, I would say just a little bit, not too much. Um, I think it's primarily gauged to people who are working on Tacit Blue Program, right. Have Blue Program, F-117. We're going back to 1977 here and perhaps even earlier in some cases. So this is the crowd that, that I'm focusing in on. Yeah, um, and things are starting to change uh, with the aerospace industry too as well. Um, and as we start to move forward in this conversation, so many sightings have gone on over the years where we have, you know, the classic flying saucers in the late 40s and 50s and uh, cigar shaped craft and, and it, it, you know, different iterations of things. Lately, uh, certainly through the 80s and 90s, a lot of black triangles and the TR3B and so forth. Um, can some of that be attributed to black ops where we just didn't know what we were looking at? Well, interesting you mentioned that, Jimmy. Let me uh, kick this off here with a very brief quote from uh, President Lincoln. Okay, and we've heard this before, but I think it's worth mentioning again here. And this is Abraham Lincoln's quote. He says, you may fool all the people some of the time. You can even fool some of the people all of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. So the point I'm making is, you just can't fool us anymore. Uh, we're not going to be fooled by these craft that they're putting up here. And it's just my personal assessment that 85%, perhaps 90% of what people are reporting as extraterrestrial UFOs are in point of fact our own deep black programs. And we're not going to be fooled anymore. I just want to state that right up front um, and give you some examples here. Uh, of these USAP programs, under that category, we've got the Hudson Valley Boomerang, that's 1982 to 1989. We've got the Southern Illinois Flying Triangle, that's January 5th, 2000. And we've got the Belgium Triangle, that's 1989 to 1990. Now, under that umbrella of those tier three level programs, right. to, to use a term by Mark McCandlish, um, we have something that they actually call this, Jimmy. They have a term for these technologies. I'm going to break this down for you in three ways. And number one, they call this, quote, ace in the hole technology. Number two, this is called trump card technologies. And number three, they're called silver bullet technologies. So if you hear about a skirmish in a third world country or something, or, or a small war or something, they are not going to bring out the ace in the hole technology for something as petty as that. This is reserved for a completely different application. We certainly did that in Iraq, the first uh, the first Gulf War, and when that F one seventeen was shot down, and I know you remember that, and and uh, the the uh, the crowd that was around the the pieces of the craft, and there it was for the first time the official recognition of the F one seventeen, but the F one seventeen, like you said, tacit blue and so forth, was in research and development for a long time prior to that, wasn't it? Well, uh, first flew in 1977. That was Have Blue's first flight. So between 1977 and November the 10th of 1988, when the Air Force acknowledged the existence of the F-117, huh, that program has already been going on for over a decade and not one security leak. Uh, everybody at the Skunk Works, all those great skunk workers working under Ben Rich uh, in Burbank, where you are, mm -hmm. they successfully kept that under wraps for over 10 years. And, and they can keep a secret when they want to. Do not kid yourself. Do not underestimate the power of what they can do. Yeah. Uh, all the development, you know, the U-2 and the SR-71, YF-12A, uh, and, of course, the F-117, right here in Burbank. That's you know, right. people are driving up Hollywood Way. You and I were talking about this earlier, but driving up Hollywood Way right over the fence, 20 yards from the road. The most secret stuff in the country is going on and 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 outsider kids playing football. And, mm -hmm. You know, nobody knows. That's right. That's right. So when we're talking about these programs, we should highlight the contractors involved. Now, there's certainly more than the three, but the, the three primary contractors, absolutely. Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, 
Boeing Phantom Works. And as we mentioned before, uh, the aerospace alley starts from San Diego, goes all the way north to Edwards Air Force Base. And when you take that trip, and you can head 14 north, you've made this trip before, Jimmy, yep. you'll end up at Air Force Plant 42 Palmdale. That is essentially the heart of the military industrial complex. Air Force Plant 42 is really where a lot of the action is taking place. Uh, at, during that 80s time frame, 82 to 89, uh, Rockwell had a, a laboratory. The Lockheed certainly has Plant 10 there. And just to uh, drive the point further here, page 186, uh, 196 of a brand new book called The Projects of Skunk Works by Steve Pace. Page 196, it says, quote, about 80% of the group's work is classified. The other 20% we can talk about. This is Rob Weiss, Skunk Works VP and general manager. So already the cards are stacked against us. 80% of what the Skunk Works does in Palmdale is completely classified black programs. Yeah, the 20% they can talk about are like tire sizes. Right, right. <laughs> that, that's all you're going to know. Um, now... Uh, I want to touch upon this, and then we're gonna we need to go backwards. I want to talk about uh, you growing up and how you got into this. But the uh, the quotes from Ben Rich, and certainly his his book that came out in ninety five was an extraordinary read. Um, but the the technology for something like stealth in the mid seventies is crazy, and the development going into the B two and the electrostatic, uh, the way that the way the way the engine, you know, all of it's nearly sure. anti gravity technology, right? Is is some of this technology uh, from ET? Is this from mm -hmm. downed aircraft? And is this stuff that uh, that, that we only know about? Hmm. That's a very good question. Now, to make that bridge, that's difficult to make that bridge. Now, I'm not saying that bridge is impossible to construct, but there's nothing in the Ben Rich collection that I have that can bridge this that gap. Uh, ben Rich did say that he was a believer, and so was Kelly Johnson. Uh, John Andrews did write back and asked him, you know, what exactly did he mean by that? Ben Rich came back and said, yes, I'm a believer in both categories. I believe everything is possible. Many of our man-made UFOs were unfunded opportunities. Be cautious, Ben Rich, essentially is what Ben stated. So now he didn't say that it was reverse engineered from crash alien spacecraft. He was just open to the idea that there were both man-made and extraterrestrial UFOs. And that's the most conservative way I can put it. How many years uh, behind are we in that? What 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 is it that we know about? Because we, you know, Ben's famous quote out here at UCLA when he said, "We have the technology to take ET home." That's a pretty extraordinary statement. And so, is that fifty years ahead, twenty years ahead? And is he referencing ET technology with with a sentence like that? Well, uh, interesting you mentioned that because a good friend of mine, Jim Goodall, is also another black aircraft researcher. He was essentially the last aviation historian to speak to Ben Rich alive. He was dying of cancer in the 93 time frame. This is when he gave his lectures. This was kind of his last chance to reach out to the public. Right. He died in 95. Now, just before Ben passed away, uh, John... Uh, Jim Goodall was able and successful to get in a telephone call to Ben Rich, and Ben Rich told Jim Goodall over the phone, quote, Jim, we have things in the Nevada desert that are 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. If you've seen it on Star Wars or Star Trek, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort, directly from Ben Rich. So according to Ben Rich, they have things in the Nevada desert that are 50 years beyond what we can even comprehend. Now that's coming from Ben Rich which is probably the highest source of all. Right. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is the AIAA organization. This is the uh, American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics. The reference for this is AIAA technical paper published on September 7th, 1988. Just read your real quick thing. This is from uh, Ben Rich directly. Now, quote, I wish I could tell you about the projects we are currently working on. They are both fascinating and fantastic. They call for technologies once only dreamed of by science fiction writers, directly from Ben Rich. So there you go right there. I mean, there's no telling what we have at this point. We could be 50, 60, 70 years ahead. 
Well, and you, uh, with all of your research into underground and agro- above ground bases and these special access programs, uh, the rumor wants to be, you know, crashed stuff from Roswell or other downed aircraft. But what I find interesting here, Michael, is that no other countries in the world have the aircraft that we do. They they just don't. It seems like we have some very, very privileged information that nobody else has had. You know, like I said, nobody else has got a B-2 bomber, right? No, but nobody else has got the, 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 the aircraft that we have. So it feels like we've had some fairly privileged information from somewhere. Um, I can't rule it out. You know what? I can't rule it out, but I have to take a, a conservative approach until we can make that absolute link. And I'm not saying that link doesn't exist, but I'm just going to you know, stay within that conservative approach and, and be able to back it up with uh, Aviation Week articles. And I want to just kind of bring your attention to a book called The Pentagon Propaganda Machine. This is by Senator J.W. Fulbright, uh, published in 1970. He says, quote, the greatest threat to American national security is the American military establishment and the non-holds barred type of logic it uses to justify its zillion dollar existence. Right. This sums it up totally. This is what we're, we're actually dealing with here. This is the problem we're going after. Anything goes with these defense contractors. Jane's Defense Weekly uh, talks about it. Aviation Week Space Technology, December 24th, 1990, they talk about it. They say, quote, eight years of the Reagan administration in Washington were very good to the black world. So that's what we're talking. Multi-billion dollar programs pumping into these black programs, no congressional oversight, no public scrutiny. 13, my last calculus, I keep adding on to it, right? It was nine, it was 10, you know, $13 trillion missing. Mm-hmm. Where did it go? When we we were talking about the X-37B uh, a little bit earlier, that is certainly evidence right there publicly of a secret space program, right? You want evidence of it? I'll give you the X-37B. And it just landed after two years in space. We know virtually absolutely nothing about that program and who is behind it. Is that where this $13 trillion is going? Well, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned the X-37B because I have it on very good, very good word from two reliable sources that when you talk about the X-planes, talk about the X-1, October 14th, 1947, when Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier, the X-2, the X-33, and you work your way up to something in the X-50 range, this is what I was told. When you hear about an X-plane, always remember that there are twice as many X-planes as actually being reported. So if you hear about an X-40, we're already at X-80. If you hear about an X-50, we're already past X-100. So there's twice as many X-planes as being reported. No question. No question. Have you... uh, Let's go back to your childhood before we hit this break. Did you ever see anything strange in the sky that you couldn't identify? I'm an aviation guy. I can look up and name any helicopter, any airplane, any time, drop of a hat. You're that You're that person, too. I get that. But when you were younger, did you see something in the sky that you couldn't explain or identify? I, honestly, Jimmy, I have not. I have not. How about as an adult? Um, technically, I have not. And I've kept my eye open, too. And I've gone to some of these spooky places. But, no, I've never seen anything. I did see one thing at Groom Lake around 97 but i don't know what it was so uh, what? you have to be fair and honest oh well that's interesting what did you see a groom like i saw that same whitish yellow light that everybody else recorded which i think could have been a flare now this is uh this was on a wednesday night and uh, right. this is when when you zoom in you can see that batman figure and i think that's an element of the camera focal length and yes. zooming in that's why you get that it's it wasn't a ufo i can't i don't know what it was it just was unknown so that's the extent of my sighting wow well one of these days i i've got to get you out with us now i have had uh, a few just a few you know not hundreds or anything like that but i've had uh Four things that happened, all arbitrary, you know, just one-off things. Uh, 
two, three things. My wife was with me, but I wasn't with a big crowd of people. Um, and then we had the, the mass sighting last year at Contact in the Desert. Now, backing up, <laughs> over uh, the Monterey Bay, uh, in 1995, 96, I saw this black triangle. I was with four friends. We're taking pictures. Anyway, make a long story very, very short. It zipped across the sky, probably 50, 60,000 feet, you know, just a little dot. But it was hauling balls. It was moving. Back when the aurora, you know, was <laughs> was being talked about. So I'm seeing this, uh, and it was going from west to east, like over my head. But then it stopped and it was it was moving. I mean, like moving this black dot and then stopped and then sat there for a couple of seconds and then shot straight up into the blue sky and disappeared. It was at three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Now, I did get a picture of this. <laughs> Excuse me. And the picture is a black triangle. Uh, 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 wrong. I'm sorry. A black pyramid. And the direction it was flying in, the flat side, not the pointed side, was, you know what I mean? Sure, no, sure. <laughs> no aerodynamics to this thing at all. But anyway, it shot up straight into the sky. Now, when I tell you something like that, coming from me, does that tell you that I'm seeing some kind of satellite being positioned, or does it sound ET-ish, or does it sound like something that could be attributed to um, a black ops project? Well, let me give you a quick example. When you see a craft such as Hudson Valley Boomerang, such as Southern Illinois Flying Triangle, and you see tubes, pipes, and cylinders on the bottom, and you hear a low-frequency electrical humming noise like an electrical transformer or like a sewing machine or even like a machine shop running in the background, right. and you have a historical legacy of 12 separate sightings that have this similar understructure, and we're talking about talking about super chilling of a superconductor and liquid mercury plasma vortexes, we could be looking at a man-made technology. Just for the fact alone of the eyewitness sightings describing what they have seen here, absolutely. And what, what you may have seen, I've got a case in my files of a, of a gentleman who was uh, going to work in the morning. This is around 1994. And he was on a motorcycle, motorcycle stopped dead. He looked up and all he saw was a gigantic big square above him. It had uh, very powerful spotlights beaming down. The whole bottom structure looked like a Midas muffler plant that was turned upside down. It had all these tubes and pipes and cylinders sticking out. He eventually walked his motorcycle three hours back to where he was going because it wouldn't run at that time. When investigators got to him two weeks later, this gentleman brought out a, a metal lighter, and the second he brought that thing out of his out of his pocket, the lighter just jumped out of this guy's hand and went right to the gas tank of that uh, motorcycle. The whole motorcycle had been magnetized. Wow. So, yep, that was a true story. Uh, they've got the technology. They have made the breakthrough. You were talking a little bit earlier about how to track the funding and, and where this is going. Mm -hmm. You as a taxpayer and anyone listening to this broadcast, they can do this as American taxpayer. I have done this. You can walk right into the Library of Congress in downtown Washington, D.C., and you can talk to the reference librarian there, and you can ask for something called Department of Defense RDT&E Programs R1. Okay, RDT&E programs R1, and it's kind of a thick, dry, boring-looking document. And they have one for the Army, they have one for the Air Force, they have one for the Navy. It's all compiled together. Within this document, they have program element numbers that tells you what number the, the program is, and they tell you kind of a name of the program. So the bottom line is you take the total amounts and you subtract the knowns, and what you're left with is the black programs. That's how you track these programs. The problem is they don't give you specific details on what that program is. Like here's one, senior year Forest Green. I've got the program element number, but they don't give you specific details of what it is. That's how you track the, the budget, and you can do that as an American taxpayer. Anybody can. Well, who who has the knowledge, right? How? If you're going over, yeah. uh, you know, you're turning over an administration every four years, maybe every eight, right? 
Um, so that's that's the that's the public side of it. Those are the politicians. The right. career people behind it are working on this for 20, 30, 40, 50 years at a crack. Who are they? Who has the knowledge of this? Somebody is planning budgets and spending the money. Right. OK, well, one way to answer that is to be very cognizant of the wording that these guys use, okay? The wording is extremely important. And I wanna ask you a question, Jimmy. Um, at the Pentagon, what do they call a hammer, Jimmy? What do they call a hammer at the Pentagon? I have no idea. Okay, so anybody listening out there, think about this in your mind's eye. What do they call a hammer at the Pentagon? Now, this is, this is actually what they call it. They call it a, quote, omnidirectional impact generator. <laughs> omnidirectional <laughs> impact. Is that the biggest word magic you've ever heard? Right. Is it any wonder they can get away with spending $400 right. for a hammer, $600 for a, a toilet seat cover? <laughs> it's the wording that counts. That's very interesting. We got to take a break right here, Michael. That that's good. I feel like I just learned something right there. Our guest tonight, Michael Schratt. This is Fade to Black. Now we're going to go through everything tonight. Now when we come back, I, I, we still haven't talked about where Michael grew up, but we're going to jump out to Hudson Valley and we're going to work our way east to west. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Michael Schratt. I'll be right back. Oh. Go to the gallery section for Michael on our website and check out the images. We'll talk about that, too, when we come back. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Hello, I'm Katie, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Hobbs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. We're the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. What's up, Fade or Nots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Tappy. I'm getting older and noticing that my body just doesn't work as well as it used to. So I like to keep fit as possible by hitting the gym a few times a week. Recently, I started having a nagging bicep pain and it got so bad I couldn't even lift the weights. When I was complaining about it to a friend, he told me about Angioprim. He said chelation helps remove toxins heavy metals, and cholesterol in veins and arteries that may cause blockages. You know, after just one week of taking Angioprim, the pain was gone, and now I'm back in the gym full strength. Scientific research proves the active ingredient in Angioprim has superior oral chelation action that helps promote cardiovascular health. So to learn more, go to Angioprim.com. That's A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M.com. Or talk to a trained consultant. Call Angioprim toll-free at 877-888. 7221. You'll feel better with more energy. Call 877-882-7221 or go to the website angioprim.com. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black, across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only 
KGRA Radio, The Planet. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Michael Schratt, private pilot, historian, public speaker. He makes me look smart, and that's all that's important here. All right, let's get that. We'll get one thing straight. Now, over at JimmyChurchRadio.com, if you click on Michael's name at the top, the post, click on that. It'll take you over to his page, and there's a gallery there. Click on the gallery button, and it will open up. I'm going to uh, open it up now. I've got it. And we're going to start off here, Michael, with the uh, <clears throat> Hudson Valley uh, UFO flap. Now, uh, it it went on for a long time. This wasn't a one-night thing. Thousands and thousands of witnesses. Um, and you've got some illustrations here of it. Now, let's kind of start there. What kicked off uh, in Hudson Valley, and what was the first sighting? Uh, first sighting actually took place on December 31st, 1982. This is coinciding with the beginning of the Reagan buildup. So I always thought that that was interesting. So that was the origin point of the Hudson Valley boomerang. Now, when we talk about these sightings, we're talking about at least 25,000 eyewitnesses between that time frame, 82 to 89. Right. What they're reporting, Jimmy, is a large, in most cases, a large, silent, boomerang v-shaped craft that can hover over the taconic state parkway hover over populated areas rivers lakes reservoirs and here's the important point it can make an a 180 degree flat turn like on a turntable and all the lights remain equidistant Many of the eyewitnesses indicated that the lights looked like they were embedded in concrete as this thing turned. Now, that's a, that's a movement that you can't get with ultralights flying in formation. Cessna 152 is flying in formation. You're not going to get that level of precision with planes flying in formation. Even the Blue Angels can't get that level of accuracy. So that's essentially the flight characteristics of what's being reported by the eyewitnesses. Now, uh, when everybody's pulling over to the side of the road, right, on the on the right. highway up there, and they're seeing this, you are going to know the difference between ultralights with Christmas lights on it, right? Mm -hmm. I, Correct. I, I just, I feel that in my bones, right? That That's would right. be, it would be debunked at the scene, right? What, Absolutely. What, Absolutely. What, what was it? Okay. The ultralight debunking part of it that they were somehow fastened together and these guys were precision ultralight flyers out there with Christmas lights uh, felt like um, uh, an easy way out. But there's no way that that many people on the side of the road, somebody would have said, no, it was ultralights. And. You would hear the, the lawnmower engines, wouldn't you? Well, I, I put together a huge reference works on absolutely destroying the ultralight theory. Keep in mind, Jimmy, this is at treetop level, right? okay? And this is at night. According to the FAA, ultralights are not allowed to fly 30 minutes after sunset. A lot of these sightings in the Hudson Valley area, and we're talking about Connecticut too, like Danbury, Brewster, New York, that whole area there, multi-state area. Um, basically, they're saying that it's at treetop level. You're not allowed to fly 30 minutes after sunset. So we're not talking about ultralights here. And instead of me just telling you, let me give you the testimony of Monique O'Driscoll. She is one of the primary uh, eyewitnesses in this case. She had a sighting of a large craft on February 26, 1983, near Kent, New York. Now, this is her statement, quote, I could see the underbelly part. It's solid. It had metal type work like cross beams and tubular things hanging down here and there. I was so close, I could have thrown a ball and hit it. This is from Monique O'Driscoll. And this is Philadelphia Inquirer, September 28th, 1984. And Jimmy, this is the same motif that I have seen throughout this case in many of the eyewitnesses. This is something that is stitched through the fabric of this case. And any New Yorkers that might be listening to this broadcast, 
If you want to know what the Hudson Valley boomerang looked like, just go over the George Washington Bridge. You can go into the upper section or the lower section. You'll get the same result. On the upper section, you'll see the two supporting structure with all these cross-beam, triangular, diamond grid-like girder work. This is exactly what Monique O'Driscoll is describing. On the lower section, on the sides of the George Washington Bridge, they have these supporting beams that go up in a triangular V shape fashion that's what these eyewitnesses are describing this is exactly what we're dealing with now uh everybody go over to the gallery right now at jimmyjohnsradio.com for uh michael and the top uh, uh we, the way that we have it laid out the top two middle images right there are the hudson valley boomerang illustrations from michael extraordinary stuff but when I look at this, the first thing that I need to to ask you, Michael, if this is our technology, why do this over the Hudson Valley for everybody to see? Huh. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I just got done giving a lecture Saturday at the Danbury Public Library, and I released what I think might be a viable possibility for this particular craft. Um, just to get back to the sighting of Kent, New York, when Monique was below this craft, she said that the lights did not haphazardly flash, but they flashed in sequence up and down the quote unquote wings of this craft. Mm -hmm. So the reds would go off, the blues would go off, the greens would go off, and then the whites would go off. This was in sequence up and down the wing of this craft, flying silently. Other people who were below this craft on the Taconic State Parkway, when they were directly below it and they looked up inside the craft because they had transparent panels, they said it looked like a cross beam and girder construction like a truss bridge. So again, we're looking at a, a very high likely man-made technology, perhaps a semi-rigid lighter, lighter than air ship type vehicle. So gas filled? Per, perhaps gas filled, but using either an electrogravitic propulsion system mm -hmm. or something with a superconductor because these tubes and pipes and cylinders might be used as liquid nitrogen cooling pipes for a superconductor. That's what we could be dealing with here. Now, uh, very similar, well, at least in the description and certainly what you've got here, uh, for the Phoenix Lights, too, as well. So are we looking at the same craft? Okay, here's another thing. When you talk about test flights of classified aircraft, they most likely occur on Thursday nights. If you look at the reference works, take a look at the Aurora sightings in the early to mid-1990s. They were always on a Thursday night. Right. On March 24th, which was a Thursday night, a massive sighting was over the Taconic State Parkway. Just 24 hours earlier than that mass sighting, Ronald Reagan gave his SDI address to the nation proposing the Star Wars program. So I'm thinking, is there a connection between these two events? That was on a Thursday night. March 13th, 1997, the Phoenix Lights, that was on a Thursday night as yep, well. Yep, yep. And now... Why Thursday? Why do they drill down so hard on Thursday? Because Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is pre-flight. Thursday's the test flight. Friday's debrief. Saturday, Sunday, there's no one there. So when you hear about something going on during a Thursday night, it's almost guaranteed it's one of ours. What about uh, Belgium then? Are you, are you suggesting that in the Belgium way that that was a lot of Thursday nights as well? Well, if you look at the understructure of the Hudson Valley Boomerang, the Belgium Triangle, and the, uh, the January 5th, 2000 Southern Illinois Triangle, they all retain a very similar understructure. They all have this uh, cross-beam girder construction. They have tubes, pipes, and cylinders. As I mentioned before, many of the eyewitnesses stated that this looked like a Midas muffler plant below it. Right. Uh, that's the case where F-16s were scrambled. Um, th there's no question, and we can even go back to what was procured under Project Paperclip and even things going on with the Bell, because they were talking about uh, counter-rotating liquid mercury plasma in a toroid donut. Right. This is what was seen on the bottom 
there was a bottom opening on the Hudson Valley boomerang. This could be what we're dealing with here on these TR3Bs that the F-16s were scrambled after. This could be what we're dealing with here. Why scramble F-16s after our own aircraft? Yeah, because in many cases, the United States Air Force does not have a need to know. This is a completely separate group. It's a defense contractor group, and the United States Air Force may not be clued in on everything that we have. That's one of those trump card technologies that the Air Force does not have a need to know on. The uh, other reports, though, uh, well, we have a lot of reports about these craft moving really, really slowly. And the large uh, triangle uh, type, you know, like the size of the, you know, the the imperial craft from Star Wars, right? Hundreds right. of yards, a quarter of a mile, moving really slowly, but then leaving the area really, really quickly. So if these are some type of lighter than air rigid, well... That removes that suggestion, right? Well, I mean, that that was seen in the Hudson Valley boomerang, and that was also seen in the Southern Illinois Triangle case, where this craft was seen by eyewitnesses at treetop level, then went over to the horizon and back in less than one second. Now, if you're using an electrogravitic propulsion system and you're using plasma stealth, then you can make this thing uh, become invisible. You can uh, basically set up your own, <laughs> similar to what was proposed on the B-2, where they're electrically charging the leading edge of the wing to reduce the radar cross signature and then negatively charging the exhaust gases. This may be what is mimicking the form, fit, and function of what people are calling extraterrestrial UFOs when their own deep black programs. And here's the other thing I was told too, comes from a reliable source. Um, when you see that there's a sighting of one of our aircraft, basically the very next day you will read about it in the uh, weekly world news as some type of an extraterrestrial event. And so they're using the ET hypothesis to cover their own deep black programs. And it's worked for 50 years. Why would they stop now? Well, uh, uh, yes, uh, I would agree with but uh, at, uh, at least that's a partial explanation. Right. But the when you look at the Taconic State Parkway and how uh, you've, you know, the flight path that's going up. Why? Why do a test flight over? Uh, you know, uh, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, uh, through, through traffic, right? Sure. Rush okay. hour traffic. What What are you doing there if you're trying to do something in a black project where you're going to have ten, fifteen, twenty thousand eyewitnesses? Okay, good question. Let me propose one possibility. This is just one possibility. Um, during the 80s, we heard nothing more than Reagan talking about the evil empire. We heard this whole concept of mutually assured destruction, uh, ICBM attack. We just kept hearing more and more about this. So, And, and we, we already talked about how that SDI announcement took place exactly 24 hours before the March 24th, 1983 huge sighting. Is it possible, and this is just a, a, a proposal here, is it possible that... <sighs> During the 1960s, when they were developing relocatable over-the-horizon radar, which is completely, uh, it's something that you can take out with a Russian missile. Wouldn't it be great if we had a mobile, airborne, relocatable over-the-horizon radar system? I am proposing that this is possibly what was seen by the eyewitnesses in the Hudson Valley, a relocatable airborne mobile over the horizon system that would be completely impervious to Russian ICBM attack. And it, it answers all the criteria. It's silent. It's triangular. It, it has multicolored flashing lights. It has the cross beam and girder construction, and it can make that 180 degree, 360 degree flat turn without banking. It answers all the criteria, Jimmy. It's just one possibility. The why do an uh, an airfoil type design with this if it's dealing with anti gravity and other propulsion systems? You don't need an airfoil design. <laughs> oh, that's a real good 
point you just brought up there, let me hit you with something that Stanton Friedman had mentioned. Now, this is talking about the Westchester sightings, 83-84. This is mm -hmm. a letter uh, from Stanton Friedman to Tony Gonzalez. This is dated January 17, 1990. Now, this is Stanton Friedman. Quote, I have always been bothered by the Westchester County sightings because I never heard of actions that would clearly label the technology alien. And then he goes on to state here, wings in outer space could only be decoration, but do of course match an earthling approach. Stanton is correct in this case. Why would you need wings in outer space? We're not talking about aircraft that operate on standard aerodynamic principles. We're That's talking right. about something completely different here. Right. Well, a a again, if it's if, uh, uh, but what is the need for the airfoils? I mean, if, if you're if you're if you're operating at ten, fifteen, twenty miles an hour, you know, really slow, no airfoil needed. Um, and if you're going to turn on a dime or rip right. out at at Mach five, Mach nine, airfoils not needed. So right. what what's is a deception? Okay. I I don't understand the need for it. Understood. Uh, in, my, in my proposal, the, the reason why they have that is because they need real estate for the antenna array on the relocatable over-the-horizon radar. If you do any research on over-the-horizon radar, what you're going to end up seeing is cross-beam and girder construction, just like the Hudson Valley eyewitnesses reported. Right. And so that's what I'm proposing. That's why they have that, because they have to have real estate for that over-the-horizon radar array. Yeah, that's interesting. And then I, I want to kind of spin something into this. When um, I witnessed, uh, I've seen a B-2 fly three or four times in my life. And every time that I've seen it fly, it was flying too slow to be in the air right uh -huh. it just if you know what i'm trying to say here it just sure, sure. it didn't make sense to me and then we found out later that there you know there's some crazy technology with with electrostatics and and the the airfoil and that um how do i want to say this that it, it's flying too slow and it's being assisted with advanced technology in its design to get it aloft that suggests to me uh, a technology that nobody else has what is going on there and is it a suggestion of some type of anti-gravity uh propulsion system okay well keep in mind that the B-2 was rolled out November 22nd, 1988. By that time, Northrop had already sunk in $22.4 billion on the program. And we were originally going to build 132 B-2s. We ended up building only 21. So obviously, logic alone would tell you that that's one of the reasons why the B-2 cost $2.3 billion per aircraft. It's more than its own weight in gold, which right. is just incredible. So right, bottom right. line is, the, the lower the number, Number, the higher it's going to cost to build each one just just by the the buy alone there's just not many so the question is could Northrop have filtered or siphoned some of that 22.4 billion on something else related to the b2 because if you look at the original configuration of the b2 stealth bomber and then you overlay what that looks like to what the eyewitnesses of the Hudson Valley boomerang, it's almost a one-to-one -one mirror image because by 1983, the Air Force changed its mind about what they wanted to do with the B-2. They were looking at a high-altitude bombing platform. Now they wanted to change it to high-altitude and low-altitude. That cost American taxpayers $1 billion for that re uh, redesign of the wing. So there's a possibility we could be dealing with something that was procured under that funding. So, but there's a difference in size, right? The Hudson there's, Valley. What there's, a have, difference a there's a difference in size. Huge difference. What, what is it? It's probably well, four to ten times the, uh, you know, the the length and and width of the craft. The B-2 is 172-foot wingspan. Right. First flight was July 17th, 1989. Now this is years after the Hudson Valley sightings, right? So it can't just be the B-2 that's responsible uh, because the dates don't line up. So we have to be talking about something else. Now, I did get a report from a Northrop General Dynamics engineer who claims that for every three B-2s 
that are built, there's one secret version built that uses this other technology. So I'm, I'm gaining more traction on something else going on with the B2 program that we don't know about. There, there appears to be more to the B2 than meets the eye. Yeah, when uh, the, uh, a couple of times that I've seen the B2 fly, I was not in a car. One time I was. We were talking about that earlier. But when I was standing outside, uh, I did not hear the engine. The only thing I heard was the wind going over the craft. It's a very bizarre thing. When you see it coming toward, you don't hear it. As it passes you, you hear just like the wind on a car when you're driving down the freeway. You know, that sound. That's what I heard. Um, so that's the, when we talk about the Hudson Valley situation, that's the correlation I can connect to because nobody right. reported any engine sound, but did anybody report air going over the craft? Well, uh, let me get you a report from Bill Scott, who's the former Rocky Mountain editor of Aviation Week Space Technology. Now, this gentleman is probably more read in to a lot of these black programs than anyone we know out there because he covered the industry for 25 years. Bill Scott is, is the best of the best. He was given a report, a reliable report. This is 1984 of a UPS driver that was driving on uh, Highway 375 near Groom Lake. Mm -hmm. He's heading in one direction. I've got the whole report on this. He's heading in one direction in his UPS truck. Approaching him from the opposite direction is what appears to be a flying wing configuration. It's down on the deck, right over the the, uh, the pavement here. This thing comes ripping across the area right over his UPS truck. It was so low, Bill told me that the compression wave that this craft made pushed down the UPS truck and all this dust started flying around the UPS truck. And then this thing went into the vertical and peeled off. And this guy got out of his truck and just saw this thing as it was departing. Now he said, quote, it looked like the B2, but wasn't the B2. So this was another one of these flying wings that to this day, since 1984, has still not been acknowledged. So there is no question that it could have been a Northrop bird, could have been a General Dynamics bird. We're mm -hmm. not for, sh for sure. It could have been um, McDonnell Douglas. But there's, there's no question that a lot of these aircraft, according to that AvWeek report, eight years of the Reagan administration were very good to the black world in Washington, D.C. Absolutely, there's no question. It sounds very similar to what I told you about earlier today, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, uh, uh, the the thing that I trip out on the most when you combine uh, Ben Rich's testimony to what we know about the the B two uh, is a black triangle. It is what we have been seeing in the skies, but we have been seeing this for years and years and years. I don't know if I can confidently say what went on in St. Louis and other sightings throughout the 60s who mm -hmm. move up to the B2 program. And that's where I'm feeling that there was some type of uh, real ET spacecraft flying around. I can't rule it out. I cannot rule it out. There's there's absolutely the possibility that we could be dealing with that. I um, want to take you back really quickly to a, a book when we talk about fraud, waste, and abuse in government spending at the Pentagon. There's a book called The Pentagonist, and it, it has the subheading, An Insider's View of Waste Mismanagement and Fraud in Defense Spending. And very quickly here, uh, they highlight a small block that is about two and a half inches long. It's about three quarters of an inch wide and about three sixteenths of an inch thick. In this, in this book, they talk about how this block, which is called a quote-unquote F-16 pulley puller, it's a tiny little thing that you can fit between your index finger and your thumb, and it's got three tapped holes in it. Jimmy, you want to take a guess at how much you as a taxpayer and all the rest of us spent on this back in 1983? You want to take a guess? Per hole? <laughs> well, per per machine block, yeah, tiny but... little block that's about two inches long, three quarters of an inch wide. How much did we spend on this back in 1983? $150,000. Nope, uh, not that much. $13,717. Right. I was going to get a tiny little block 
that you could build for for no more than two dollars. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say fifteen grand, but I thought I'd go to the extreme side. Sure. Well, yeah, uh, but I don't know how many we've built. A hundred, thousands, maybe. I don't know. But that's that's how they, you hide the money. Privileged. Yes. yes. The the defense contractors feel privileged. Uh, that they have a right to overcharge the American taxpayer. It's been going on for decades. And since we're on this roll here, we've got to talk about the F-22 Raptor, the Lockheed Martin F-22. Uh, cost per plane, according to CNN, Jimmy, is $412 million per plane. This is the same company that in 1955, under Kelly Johnson, built the U-2 spy plane for $1 million. Mm -hmm. So can you see where I'm going with this? I do. Here, here we're saying that you can you can buy or you can build 412 U-2 spy planes for the cost of one F-22. Right. Something's going on here. Yeah, something, something on something's here. wrong. Let's, uh, let's take a break right here. And uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about the TR-3B. Uh, I, you know, I do want to talk a little bit about Kelly Johnson and Skunk Works, too, as well. That was a great era. Our guest tonight, Michael Schratt. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back. Stay with us. here we listen to jimmy church you're listening to fade to black always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk jimmy church with fade to black kgra radio.com <laughs> end time is not what you thought in their new book, 122436, authors Mike and Cheryl Gilmore bring forth a startling new idea on the beginning of humankind, how life begins on Earth, and when our Creator concludes this age. In the book, 122436, three small groups of individuals, separated by thousands of miles, discover together the answers to the beginning of our universe and all the life it contains. Mike Gilmore is the author of five Levels of Power novels and the Sled Investigation series. Cheryl Gilmore is current state director director in South Carolina for MUFON and brings a lifetime of experience with UFOs and related fields. As a team, their new book about life in the near future on Earth sets aside most people's religious and scientific beliefs. Available exclusively on Amazon in softback for $8.99 or the ebook price for only $2.99. Remember, Amazon softback $8.99, ebook only $2.99. 12-24-36. Get your copy today. Hey there, quick question for you. Would you be okay with more energy, more endurance, thicker, healthier hair, a better mood, reduced appearance of wrinkles, improved sleep, improved blood pressure and cholesterol profiles, improved vision, improved memory? Okay then. Well now, have you heard of Nature's Youth RSF? It's from the anti-aging experts at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. See, at Nature's Youth, they understand exactly what it means to provide top quality health products. And Nature's Youth customers not only improve their health, they know they're also providing their body with the right nourishment to maintain that peak performance and fight the aging process. If health, wellness, and nutrition are what you desire, choose Nature's Youth RSF. I did. You see, you're going to get older. It's just up to you how you feel when you get there. Get started today. Nature's Youth RSF. Simple to use, simple to order. Go to naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao.
All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Michael Schratt, private pilot, military aerospace historian, and lecturer. He was just in, uh, he is in, featured in Stephen Greer's new movie, Unacknowledged, and we'll talk about that too in just a bit. But Michael, I want to talk about the TR-3B, the sure. the sightings over uh, St. Louis, uh, and also, you know, the windows that were on the side, I always found very, <laughs> sure. very interesting. But also similar in description about what was going on over in uh, Belgium. Now, is the TR-3B, in your estimation, a real craft? Um, you've got some excellent illustrations uh, up in, in the gallery, too. Um, is it a real craft, or is, you know, what are people seeing here? Good question. Well, when we talk about the TR-3B, we have to give credit to Edgar Fouché. He's the origin point of almost everything associated with this craft. We have to give him credit, whether people feel he's a controversial figure or not. But uh, I did speak to him multiple times. I know him very well. I post a series of very detailed questions, and I actually asked him to draw me an illustration of his sighting, which he claims he saw in 1979 at, at Groom Air Base. And believe it or not, the gentleman followed through with what he said he would do. He did describe his case. He drew me an illustration. He discusses how this TR-3B, which has two different sizes, and uh, TR-3B uh, stands for Teledyne Ryan in his estimation. So maybe that's a clue on the contractor. But basically, he states that there's a 300-foot-per-side vehicle. There's also a 600-foot-per-side uh, vehicle. And it has a central core, which is called a magnetic field disruptor, that has a... Oh, we lost you for a second. Okay. Core. To, oh, still there? Okay. Yeah, we, we lost you a couple of times. But yeah, it, it's really weird. I don't see anything wrong okay. with the signal. Okay. Uh, I, okay. Start with the beginning of the propulsion system, the central okay. field. According to Edgar Fouché, this craft has a magnetic field disruptor. And what is proposed in the propulsion system is a liquid mercury plasma is pressurized to 250,000 atmospheres and rotated at 50,000 RPM. Now, when that happens, there's a warpage of the gravity field by up to 89%, reducing the G-forces by 89%. Now, this is per Edgar Fouché's description. This is a, see what we're seeing on the movement of these craft. We're seeing these stop-on-a-dime maneuvers. We're seeing these right-angle turn maneuvers. Uh, we're seeing these high 40G maneuvers that are explained by the propulsion system if this is true. Now, again, Edgar told me that this was in 1979. A lot of the sightings started right around the mid-1970s, so it's consistent with what we see with the eyewitnesses. Except for st louis mm -hmm. that's that's true that's true now when you talk about the southern illinois triangle this was january 5th 2000 there were at least three separate triangular craft according to the police officers involved in this case and there was also another particular craft that was boxy it looked like a single story ranch with a penthouse on top. This is by Melvin Knoll, who was a truck driver and miniature golf course owner at the time, where this craft flew about mm, a quarter to a half mile away. He saw the thing and he said it was as big as a football field and it slowly floated, did not fly, but floated by his miniature golf course. And I think that's one of the photographs or illustrations that I put up on the website, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it, it's yeah. extraordinary. And these sightings in St. Louis, though, they go back to 1967, where there was another very, very similar description back then with windows and the lights on the back of the craft and nearly flew in the same flight path, which is kind of strange, too, as well. I mean, what? why St. Louis? Hmm. I'm not sure why they would pick that area. Uh, there were allegedly no... Uh, military applications going on near Scott Air Force Base, I think it is. Right. Um, we don't know for sure. But one thing I will state, though, is there were multiple police officers, uh, and one in particular who stated that the bottom 
of the Southern Illinois Triangle. I've got his quote here. This is police officer David Martin from Shiloh, Illinois Police Department. That's right. He said, the bottom of the craft resembled building blocks with plumbing pipes. <laughs> this is what they reported on the Hudson Valley boomerang. So, again, we've got 12 separate cases of this very interesting bottom understructure that we're seeing throughout all these cases. What does that tell you about the technology, though? Uh, is this something that, and I know you touch upon this a little bit in Unacknowledged, and I do want to get to Dulce and, and some other stuff, too. I, I don't want to run out of We've got so much to talk about with you, Michael. Right. But what does this tell you about the technology? Is this really something that would upset the entire, I mean, would we have a worldwide riot in the streets if, if there is technology being used that isn't being shared with you and I and the status quo, you know, the common man, we could all use this technology. I don't know if there'd be riots in the streets, but let me give you the description of a gentleman who saw one of these black triangles fly right over his head. This is on November the 22nd, 1985, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, a large black triangle f flew right over his head. Now, let me just read you really quickly his statement. Uh, the bottom or underside of the craft resembled, quote, the back of a refrigerator, like a collection of condensation pipes that ran back and forth. After gliding over the witness vehicle, uh, the craft departed at a tremendous speed and left no sonic boom. So would, would there be a, a, a cry for the technology being declassified? Yes, there would. Would there be riots in the street? I'm not sure, but we have we have got the technology. We have made the breakthrough. There is no question. Now, the illustration that you have, everybody, just go over to Michael's uh, gallery page, and you'll see the, the black triangle with the pipes underneath. What are we looking at here? And also, you brought up Mark McCandlish earlier. I want to Correct. address him, too, as well. But what would be going through these pipes? And there's two I'm, different. There's yeah, two I'm different. proposing that those pipes are being used to super chill a superconductor with liquid nitrogen. That's just what I'm proposing. And what would the with the superconductor? Would that be a, a, a series of plates? That, that would be part of what Edgar Fouché is talking about with the magnetic field disruptor. Because remember the Nazi bell, and all roads seem to lead back to those paperclip scientists. Right. The Nazi bell used uh, counter-rotating liquid mercury plasma in that bell-shaped device. Uh, which was being pressurized, also seen in the Kecksburg Acorn, could be a, a similar type craft. But if if the if the Nazi bell was a true event, um, as Joseph Farrell talks about, and is very credible, very credible reports, if that was a true vehicle, and if that rotating liquid mercury plasma technology was utilized at that time then that may explain the reverse engineering used for the TR-3B. I'm just proposing this could be something that they've done. They might have used those uh, scientific advancements that were done under the bell to create the propulsion system for our triangles, and they shared that technology with the United Kingdom. And the Woodhead Pass uh, UFO is also, I keep, I keep going back to St. Louis, but these are very, very similar descriptions uh, and also not too far apart in uh, the, the timeline of the sighting. Absolutely. Woodhead Pass was a case that I got from David Marler. He was gracious enough to give that to me. I have to give him credit for that. That case did not make it into the book. But according to the primary eyewitness, this is August 25th, 1990, he and his wife departed from a Fleetwood Mac music concert. It was about uh, 11.45 p.m. They were driving down the road. The, the wife was sleeping in the passenger seat. And uh, they had just gone under this dark, misty cloud. And emerging from this cloud was what he termed a 100 to 200 foot side uh, flying triangle, completely black. It had a uh, uprooted section in the midsection. There was one light at the terminating corners and then one other bright beaming light in the center. And then he said, in this indented section of the craft, there was a look like a, a girder crossbeam and structure 
type section, just like the George Washington Bridge. And so that's how I built that cardstock model. And as you've seen in these uh, illustrations that we posted, I want to make those blueprints available to people so they can build their own UFO based off of an actual sighting. Why, why the lights? Why the lights at each corner of the triangle and one in the center? Uh, in, in many cases, according to Edgar Fauché, some of those lights are not lights at all, but they're multi-mode impulse engines. So they're not lights at all. That could be what we're dealing with, according to Edgar Fauché. Now, uh, to over to Mark McCandlish. Uh, right. Mark, of course, uh, a guest on the show many times. I've had him over at Coast, too, as well. Uh, the ARV, uh, the Alien Reproduction Vehicle, um, uh, his his research, as you know, uh, is that we are reproducing an alien vehicle, and that is a lot of what we've been seeing in the skies, too. Um, the propulsion systems and the cooling and how he has described it is also very similar to what is being proposed here with that I see with his triangle craft. Um, what is it that Mark McCandlish has been seeing, and is the ARV indeed a reproduction of an alien spacecraft. Uh, well, they did call it the alien reproduction vehicle. That was the, the nickname they gave it. It was also known as the flux liner. Mm -hmm. Now, to, to try to bridge the gap and state that that was actually reverse engineered from a crash UFO retrieval, to me, it, it, it might be a little bit difficult to, to bridge that gap. I'm not saying it can't happen. Maybe they did. But if you look at the funding over the past 60 years in technology and look at what Lockheed's doing, look at what Martin was doing, uh, look at what Stephen Greer talks about. And I provided Stephen with some of these reference works. Look at what they were doing in the early to mid 1950s. I'm not going to read all these here, but let me just go over one of them. This is vintage 1955. Now, according to Stephen Greer, we made the gravity breakthrough in October of 1954. Does this have any bearing on the historical record? Well, it turns out it does actually. Uh, Amarillo Daily News, November 29th, 1955. It says, this is the the front page here spaceship marvel scene if science can outwit gravity they they go on to say here many in america's aircraft and electronic industries are excited over the possibility of using its magnetic and gravitational fields as a medium of support for amazing flying vehicles which will not depend on air for lift spaceships capable of accelerating in a few seconds to speeds many thousands of miles per hour and making sudden changes of course at these speeds without subjecting their passengers to the so-called g-forces caused by gravity's pull are also envisioned jimmy this is exactly what we're talking about in these triangular vehicles dating back to november 29th 1955 amarillo Yes, Amarillo Daily News, and I've got at least 12 different newspaper articles talking about the historical legacy of this gravity research they were doing in the 1950s. And as you know, and Greer has borne this out, this appeared to go black. And according to Dr. Greer, the breakthrough was made October 1954. That is consistent with what I'm seeing here in these newspaper articles. Here's another one. Won't read them all here. Council Bluffs, 11-27-1955. Front page heading, Conquest of Gravity, Aim of Top Scientists. Uh, one almost fantastic possibility is that if gravity can be understood scientifically and negated or neutralized in some relatively inexpensive manner, it will be possible to build aircraft, Earth satellites, and even spaceships that will move swiftly into outer space without strain beyond the pole of Earth's gravity field. They would not have to wrench themselves away through the brute force of powerful rockets and through expenditure of expensive chemical fuels. That's exactly correct. Why are we still using liquid rockets that the Nazis developed with the V2 in 1943? You mean to tell me we don't have anything better after all these years? Here in 1955, they're talking about completely doing away with liquid rockets altogether. Why New Mexico, though? And this is what's interesting here. Uh, we have Roswell. Uh, it's beyond coincidence. 
But all of the testing and all of this research going back to we could bring up uh, Paul Benowitz too as well, and 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 Schneider, and and Dulce. Right. Why New Mexico? And is it possible that that research was concentrated there because of an ET influence? Well, look at where the paperclip scientists were uh, brought into. They were bought, brought into White Sands. Yep. They were brought into Fort Bliss. Yep. And they were brought into Dayton. Okay. Those were the three locations. So maybe they were experimenting on these after World War II. Did they cut a deal with Americans uh, to expunge their Nazi backgrounds? In many cases, they did. This is the dirty little secret that America doesn't talk about, how they whitewashed the records of these Nazis who eventually headed up our space program. That's what they don't want to talk about. But this is consistent with a lot of where these crashes took place is the same area where these scientists were sent. So let's talk about Dulce for a second. You've spoken about this for a long time. Um, is, is, uh, well, what do you, what do you think is going on at Dulce? Jimmy, I have to be completely honest with you. I don't feel a hundred percent confident that I know the inside track about Dulcie, so I just don't feel qualified to discuss it. I just don't. Why? why? Well, I'm going to ask you why. <laughs> uh, why? Because I, I just don't have a whole lot of technical background and technical uh, papers to back up a lot of the Dulcie claims. I tend to focus more on the nuts and bolts aircraft end of it rather than what might be going on at Dulce. I just honestly don't know what's going on there. I'm not going to deny it, but I just don't know if there's an underground facility as is claimed to the extent that we've heard. And when we, you know, all of the reports officially too from the United States Air Force about uh, the debris from Roswell going to Wright-Patterson, going to uh, Area 51 to uh, ultimately as well, um what do you what do you make of that when we talk about the uh the 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 foreign technology building at at uh, Wright Patterson and uh Area 51 and these technologies uh and things being backward engineered The only thing I would say is we have run our country almost as a template from what those paperclip scientists were doing because they had the same thing set up in Germany, which eventually became our CIA. They had the same space program in Pina Monde, even with the countdown. We, we stole all that from those German scientists. So they were used as a template or guideline for how we would set up our intelligence industries and all the intelligence gathering networks that we set up, the NSA. It's patterned after those German originals. So it's not any kind of a leap to think that the scientists involved in these programs would have been based where they were put and the crashes were retained there as well. Well, why would um, Oberg and, and uh, Von Braun uh, reference to the help that they got that you know came from off-world? Is, is that also a disinformation slant? Don't know, don't know. But I will tell you that uh, Jimmy, Good, uh, Jimmy Doolittle, General Doolittle was questioned on this, and it came down that uh, some secrets are better left unsaid. That's the word I heard. So I will just leave that for the audience to decide what they want. So it certainly appears that Jimmy Doolittle knew something. You would think he would know something about this. Sure. But that's that's what I was told from from uh, the paperwork that I have uh, regarding Jimmy Doolittle. So well, there could be something there. Could yeah, something and there. when we talk about the bell and what was going on uh, in Poland and Germany back then, there was nothing else on planet Earth that was even close to these ideas. Forget about the technology that was being developed. I'm talking about just the idea of invention and creativity. Uh, and and where did this this... These ideas come from for anti gravity and and mercury counter rotating. It, it's it's just way beyond what we were talking about back then. Well, keep in mind too that, as you know, Jimmy, some of the uh, Nazis that the Russians got were better than the Nazis that we got in many cases, and that's why when we had our F eighty six go up against the MIGs, that they were beating us time and time again because. 
those MIGs, those Russian MIGs, were built and patterned after those German original designs. So they already had a leg up on us maybe 20 years advance to what we had. So there's, it's any wonder that they could have done this. Uh, it's all patterning after that original German designs. Well, and then, okay, you're, a, you're an aerospace historian. Help me understand the Foo Fighters. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know what that could be. Uh, according to Greer, I have no reason to doubt him. A lot of those Foo Fighter orbs went right through the B-17 fuselage. I mean, talking about right through the fuselage. This is 1942-1943 time frame. Don't know what that could be. Don't know what that could be. <sighs> okay. Sure. Now, now we're going to go into kind of a strange area here. Um, when we're talking about Greer and CE5 contacts and orbs, mm -hmm. which I have witnessed myself many times, I can't explain this. When you go out and you see something like this in person, and you haven't seen it yet. You just told me you've, you've only had your one Correct. sighting. When you see uh, a large orb take off from planet earth and that's a hundred feet in diameter and it's it's a ball and it goes off into the atmosphere it leaves the ground and goes up into space right in front of you what are you seeing how do you explain that away uh you could be looking at a genuine et craft uh you could be looking at something military that doesn't have any structure there's just no telling what that could be. I, I don't know what that would be. But I would just refer back to Ben Rich, who talked about technologies, craft that we have that are 50 years beyond what we could comprehend. Not, not that what we have, but that what we could comprehend. He, he talked about Star Trek being there, done there and doing that. So anything you see in Star Wars, anything you see in Star Trek, it's already been done by the skunk workers. Even Ben said that anything you can imagine, the skunk works can do. And they can do it. They are at the best of the best. And I always follow, found it very interesting that in the middle 1990s, of all the defense contractors that Lockheed could have merged with, they picked Martin Corporation, the Martin Marietta Corporation, to become Lockheed Martin. Martin, if you've done any research on that company, was the one that was spearheading the gravity research yep. in the 1950s. That's borne out by Nick Cook's book, Hunt for Zero Point. Right. So these two forces joined up. And this is perhaps what Mark is talking about when we believe that Lockheed is is the prime contractor for a lot of these vehicles. Now, again, back to Greer and the CE5 stuff. Uh, well, not just, but he's certainly made it very visible to us. But when you are going out with a large group of people and summoning these craft, and then you start seeing things in the sky and they appear and they're doing a show for you, is beer uh, is greer correct I, it is a it's a fantastic thing to witness but what is I going can't on i on it jimmy because i haven't seen it i don't know i'm not the world's authority on what might be done in a ce5 uh, initiative and i just don't feel qualified to discuss it well <laughs> that's fair enough but how does that make i mean when you hear that though that's the thing when you hear that what do you think is is going on is it is it interdimensional? Is it, you know, I, I have no idea, but it certainly is real. This is not something that is uh, mm -hmm. fictitious or imaginary. This stuff actually happens. All I would say is we have the technology now to mimic the form, fit, and function of ET vehicles, and you would never know the difference. We've already cited many examples here. The triangles, the boomerangs, the cigar-shaped craft, the, tr uh, the pyramidal-type craft, at least 12 other sources. Um, you can't tell who's who anymore. Uh, that's the way they want it. That's the way they want it. And they do it because they can. There's no question. You could not tell the difference at this point. It looks identical. Now, with all of your aerospace guys, we have uh, about three minutes before the next break. With all of your aerospace contacts uh, out there, have has anybody ever suggested that they have been exposed to uh, uh, ET type of, of projects or technology out there that, that uh, the president wouldn't know about? 
Um, if you if you uh, interview these skunk workers, they're very straight laced individuals. Right. They follow a conservative path, although what they design and build may not be conservative. These guys are the real deal. They're straight shooters. Um, they have not told me anything like that. Uh, I have not run into any skunk works engineers who who have uh, made those statements. No, I have not. And and then we have the other question of not only uh, stealth materials but composite materials. Materials, uh, right. light stuff, carbon fiber, uh, you know, certainly Kevlar, um, mm-hmm. and the leap that happened after 1947, not directly referencing Corso, but we can go to the historical record and see that after 1947, all bets were off. It just seemed like we had this leap in technology on all fronts of industry. Well, What I would say to that, and you you talked a little bit about stealth right there, when we're talking about the F-22, for example, at one time, that program was shrouded in secrecy. The F-22 was a very classified program. Now, we've already stated that the cost of the F-22 is $412 million per plane. Right. I'm asking, and, and others have asked this too, is are some, repeat, some black programs being used as a sacrificial lamb to hide the funding of other programs, that's a possibility we need to explore as well. Yeah, very interesting. We're going to take a break right here, and uh, we'll open up the phone lines, too, as well when we come back. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Michael Schratt, private pilot, military aerospace historian, and all-around smart guy. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Church Radio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation. And Angioprim is the result, a safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now for a special radio offer from Angioprim. That's angioprim.com slash radio, A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M. Angioprim.com slash radio or call 877-882-7221. That's 877-882-7221. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. My name's Doug Salamone, and I have a new show for you that will blow your mind. So what kind of show is it? It's a podcast, and it's called In the News. And you can find us at inthenewspodcast.com. We talk about what's new, what's crazy, what's out of this world, and we'll dissect those thoughts, ideas, and events right here on the show. And hear all the news you may have missed or really don't give a crap about but want to hear anyways. So come on over and meet me at inthenewspodcast.com. That's inthenewspodcast.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. 
I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony, damn it! This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. Our guest tonight, Michael Schratt. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, opening up the phone lines, 323-825-5045. Now, uh, Michael, before we get to the phone calls, right. uh, Aurora, yes. what's going on? It, it That was that was the thing and hasn't been talked about, it seems like, in 10 years. What's going okay. on with Aurora? Sure, sure. Okay. Let me try to address this the, the best way I can. After the January 28th explosion of the Challenger Space Shuttle, um, the U.S. Air Force Department of Defense, they lost what they called their assured access to space. Let me repeat that. They lost their assured access to space. That is actually an industry term that they use because NASA, in its own charter, admitted that it is not a civilian agency, but is in point of fact a military agency. And over 70% of shuttle cargoes were military satellites, military applications, military cargo. So that's the the first thing we need to to keep in mind. Immediately after Challenger exploded, there was a coincidental, uh, can't call it a, a destruction, but a loss of Titan boosters as well because they lost the shuttle. Now, since the shuttle was out of commission, they transferred over to Titan boosters. And wouldn't you know it, they had Titan booster failures coinciding with the Challenger explosion. So they were out of business completely. In 1986, they were out of business completely. Now, I got this from basically not only Bill Scott, but uh, James Petty, who is also the senior Basically, he was the senior eyewitness in this case. Word went out to the defense contractors, including Lockheed, Boeing, McDonnell uh, Douglas, to build a rapid response to stage to orbit space plane system that could launch rods from God that had depleted uranium rods and then a very high powerful low Earth orbit satellites with optics that would just blow anything away. This was kind of the mandate. And so what is believed to have happened is Boeing was involved, McDonnell Douglas was involved, uh, Lockheed was involved, and they built at least one and perhaps at least two, uh, two stage to orbit space plane systems, which is called the XB-70 Valkyrie or the Super XB-70, something that is about 200 feet in length. It has a 120-foot wingspan. And the smaller XOV, or Experimental Orbital Vehicle, fits conformally on the underbelly of this craft and is dropped from the uh, belly of the of the mothership. That's the launching mechanism for this particular craft. So if if people who are listening to this broadcast... If you can picture an ice cream scooper, right, and you take the XB-70 and you start relieving the bottom section of the XB-70 that's over at the uh, Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. I've seen it. That's essentially what you've got with this two-stage orbit space plane system. Now, the smaller XOV craft contains uh, four linear aerospike engines that are grouped in two banks that was seen by an F-15 pilot back in 1994 at Holloman Air Force Base. And so that is a kind of a brief overview of what may be termed the Aurora. But in this particular case, according to Bill Scott, it was called the Black Star Program. Now, here in Southern California, we had sonic booms, it seemed like, every day. Uh, Certainly, I remember the summer of 84, 85, 86, like right through that period, we had them all day long, and and we just stopped talking about it. They were so common. No mention of space shuttles, right? But we had these sonic booms, um, right. and everybody was talking about the Aurora, but now done. But just recently, we've had these new hangars built out at Area 51. Huge, and you've seen them. 
What are yes. those being built for? They're, it's it's well, almost too big for the Aurora. If you have a massive XB70, now I'm not just talking about the XB70. I'm talking about a super XB70, something that was called, quote, elegant lady. Right. For those who know yes. on the inside track. Yep, yep. This thing is big. I can't stress this enough. This thing is massive. It has to be big enough to support a 90-foot long XOV because there's two sizes of the XOV, 60 and 90 feet across. Right. So this thing is nothing short of of gargantuan. Right, right. It's huge in size. What would you need to do? Well, you'd need to have a mating and a demating section for a craft like that. That might explain those big hangers. Well, you remember Bob Lazar when he described sure. that aircraft that was sitting on the runway uh, that he thought might have been the Aurora, but he also said it was gigantor. It was huge. Mm-hmm. It was huge. Right. Now, well, uh, um, well, you know one, what? Uh, well, one reason <laughs> for the size, Jimmy, is yes. because you, when you're using a gelled boron fuel that has the consistency of toothpaste, you need to have the interior volume large enough to support that fuel. Right. That's why these things are so big. Let's uh, let's go to the phones. Got a bunch of phone calls waiting. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Michael Schratt. Yeah, hi, Michael. This is Cliff in Houston, Texas. Hey, I uh, want to add something to your show, I hope I can, about the government hiding things. Yes. This is, this is a little bit different. But anyway, in, in the late 60s, they had Wilkinson Sword was a company that made razor blades, and they gave away samples in Brooklyn and Manhattan. Girls just hand them on the corner, and they just handed out samples. And I took a couple of those homes, and those damn razor blades lasted for weeks. I mean, <laughs> weeks, and I shaved every day. When you went out, when their little giveaway campaign was over, and you went out and bought the regular ones, yeah, those damn things didn't last four or five shaves. They got technology out. If they have it in razor blades that they've yeah. never given to us, can you just imagine what else they have? That's pretty but interesting. The reason take. they don't, it costs. It, it would cost them billions of dollars. Think of the industries that would go down the tube if mm-hmm. they turn loose. Just anti gravity, <laughs> the automobile right. industry, tires, just everything. They're not going to give it to us. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I thank you for the phone call, call, Cliff. Yeah, excellent point, Michael. He's on track. He's on track. He's yes. right. He's got it. He gets it. He gets it. Let's uh, let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Michael Shrat. Michael, how are you doing tonight, brother? Hi. Glad to be with you. Jimmy, this is Ben from Bristol. Hey, oh, Ben. How are you, Ben? I'll tell Michael who ben, you I'm are after good. after you're done. Oh, 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 Ben, before we move on, dude, Junior, what is this going to yeah. do to NASCAR, man? Major impact, right? Yeah, there, major, on the whole sport. major impact. Uh, Michael, I'll just tell you, this is Ben from uh, Bristol Motor Speedway. He's the vice president out there at Bristol Motor Speedway. Okay. Uh, big listener to the show, but uh, it knows his stuff. So, Ben, what's your question for Michael? I got, I got to hear this. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I'm listening to your show tonight. Really, really great, uh, really great stuff going on. So I wanted, I wanted to go back. I'm going to go back to 1980, Michael. Okay. And um, so I grew up in um, uh, basically Appalachia in eastern Kentucky uh, before I moved down to Bristol. And I had the, an experience in 1980 when I saw a triangular craft come over our mountains. And when I say mountains here, our mountains are really, they're, they're tightly knitted. Basically, you have a hillside, and it comes down, it goes into a river, and then there may be a railroad track, and then a highway, and then it goes back up the other side. But anyway, this this is probably what got me interested in UFOs, paranormal, whatever. But um, but saw this craft come over the mountains, and uh, and it was extremely slow moving, triangular in, shla- in, in shape. Mm-hmm. And um, then it it came across the mountains, and then it went. Um, it, it made an abrupt 45 degree angle turn. It didn't bank. It didn't do anything. But it was very low to the ground. Uh, some when I when I when I hear about the Phoenix Lights, it almost it, it almost is similar to something like that. And I always in in the back of my mind, I always said, you know, that's something that is military. And I'm thinking, you know, where were we in 1980 with regards to craft that could 
move slowly without any sound but could make an abrupt movement like that. Yeah, hey Ben, and how big be, how big was it? Man, it was big. It it was um it was I'm gonna say, Jimmy, I I'm telling you it was probably I would say three times a, a normal airliner. You know, three three times your seven forty at that time let's say seven forty seven. That's huge. Three, three times that size. Yeah, yeah. Um Michael, what's the wingspan on a seven forty seven? Oh boy, I'm not sure offhand. <laughs> it's big. It's got to sure. be 200 feet, I would think, right? So he's talking about a craft 600, 800 feet across. Uh, again, very similar to other reports, but this is 1980 over the Appalachian Mountains. Yeah, well, this there, is was in Eastern a, Kentucky, there was a there was a flat in Lumberton, North Carolina, from, in 1975, yeah. but it wasn't as big as this gentleman stating. Right. Yeah, um, and when you hear something like this, Michael, again, what do, what are you feeling? Uh, another black project? Were we were we that far along in 1980 with something like that? I would say yes yeah. because of the statements made by Ben Rich. Right. You know, if we're that far advanced, and not just what we could build, but what we could comprehend. So going back to 1980, yes, we would have that technology. Ben, that's an extraordinary yeah. sighting, and I don't think you've ever told us about that. Is this something no, you I, don't? No, I never have, Jimmy. That, and 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 we, you know, I've always told you that I wanted to to discuss about you know what got me in on this, right? At the at the get go, but um, but yeah, it was really interesting because it, there was no sound, there was no, um, it was more of the movement of the craft that impressed me so much. Um, yeah, I mean, I um. Any windows I, or I, anything? I can, I can I can go into it more in depth somewhere down the road. You know, I sure. can talk offline or something. Sure, but um, but it, it just made it a, a, an a, an abrupt movement, um, um, like at an exact angle. It didn't stop. It didn't bank. It didn't turn. It moved, and then it moved literally in a forty five degree angle, and it just cut and just kind of went on across the sky yeah it didn't and, um, it didn't bang i had multiple people that saw the same thing too so um, wow wow that's and I never extraordinary it. i didn't know any better at it, that age <laughs> so are the are the board of directors at bristol gonna pull you in a room um you know tomorrow morning and go ben we got to talk about uh what's going on in your life man we were listening to fade to black Jimmy, last night. I, I don't I don't care if they do, brother. I'll tell you. You know that. You know me. I'm straight up. <laughs> Man, Ben, thank you for that. Thank you for the phone call. And and again, I don't know what NASCAR is going to do next year, man. I mean, seriously. I mean, look, yeah. we we go we went through this with Kale. We went through this with with Dale uh, Senior or Richard Petty. You know, when when yeah. when these Tony, guys Tony Stewart last year, right? Stuart Tony Stewart Gordon the year before. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's a. It's um it, it's certainly a a movement through the sport that we're going through right now where we are needing to usher in the younger crowd and fortunately we saw a younger guy win this past weekend at Talladega so yeah well you know, who, who knows? well you know I'm, I'm Michael I have to ask my NASCAR stuff while I've got Ben on the phone <laughs> That's uh, fine. who's going to be the next superstar who's going to be the next junior I don't know I know right I think, I think Chase Elliott has a really good opportunity to step up and be that person. But yeah. he was on his roof, you know, this past weekend. But um, but he's that, you know, he's he has that guy he can carry on the name. And then you have um, you have uh, you know, Ricky Stenhouse who won, you know, at Talladega. And there's there's some guys that are going to be bringing it on, and, and they'll keep the motors turning, and we'll keep on plugging. Yeah, we go through this every time one of the you know the the big guy retires every year. But and and you know, oh, it's going to be the death of. You know, it, you, you know, pick that, pick, pick the the auto racing format. It doesn't matter if it's Formula One, NASCAR, Indy. It doesn't matter. Oh, sure, yeah. But but with with NASCAR this time around, um, I have to say they must be freaking out. They they've got to wonder about ticket sales and 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 everything else because uh, Junior is just such a force and his fan base is huge. It's huge. He is, you know, the good part about it is, is that he has his motorsports team in base, and he's going to stick around the sport, and he's going to continue to fill the drivers that he fills, and and I think that you know that that everything will be well off, you know, in in the long run. But it, it's really interesting timing. And, well, um, it is because I he's... was really, to be honest with you, Jimmy, I was really surprised 
between me and you and the fence post that he came back this year after well, what he went through last year with the concussion and all that. Stuff. Well, there's that part of it, back. but he's still a kid. We look at him as being junior, right? He's still a kid. He's still very yeah. young, and it took us all by surprise. The, the other thing for me, because you know I'm a junior guy, I, I right. wanted him to have the breakout year where he just won every single race, ran away with the championship, and laughed and won and did all of those things. And I feel like it's it's a little premature and it's left us, you know, wanting. You know, that's the thing. He's too young to. We just needed that one year out of junior. Yeah, I'm with you. I hear you loud and clear, my friend. All right. Well, there's a conspiracy behind this. I know it. Hey, Ben, <laughs> ben thank you so much, man. Give my best to your family. All right, but hey, Michael, thanks, man. I, I like I said, I still feel that that was a military craft. I don't think that that was anything um, alien oriented. I think that was something that we were experimenting with. Just, uh, but uh, um, enjoying the conversation tonight. You guys keep it up. Great job as always. Hey, thanks That's a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much, Ben. Keep listening because I'm going to continue talking about you. Thank you so much. All right, you got it, brother. Bye bye. You got it. Now, when somebody like Ben, uh, Michael, this is, we're talking. You know, this is uh, this is uh, an executive at a major, uh, you know, uh, 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 race track here in the United States. Um, you know, he, he he is, you know, a professional. And when he comes forward like that, it's just like any other. Not you know, not a whistle, but he's somebody with with cred and and a career behind him. But he doesn't care, and he's coming forward with something like this. What does that tell you about the other stuff that has been reported over the it, years? It says that those cases are just as reliable as his, and I believe his case absolutely. Jimmy, really quick, getting back to that Woodhead triangular UFO that was seen in 1990 over Barnsley, England. Let me read you very quickly what the eyewitness stated. Uh, now, this is coming directly from the eyewitness. He says here, quote, the side of the craft appeared to have several illuminated windows. Right. And at one of the windows, I saw two to three figures that appeared to be human. Certainly nothing about the figures made me think they were anything other than human, reinforcing my belief that the craft was a military project. Yeah, that's why I was asking Ben if there yep. was any windows. Yep. Okay. Now, moving on, uh, we've got a, a, about 10 minutes left. And before we do get to the end, I want to thank you for uh, finding the time to uh, come on with us tonight. And we will continue this conversation sure. on a future show. But I want to I want to bounce around a little bit and, and talk about some of these other. We were talking about the Aurora. Then we okay. have things like which see it seems to me that the talk is quieted on these different projects. One, the X-43A. I thought that that was going to take off and it was going to be a technology that we would be talking about, seeing, witnessing, testing. X-43A just kind of like has disappeared. Mm, well, let's get back to where we kind of started here. When you hear about X-40, X-43, it, Jimmy, we're already beyond X-80. Right. We're already beyond that. So it's it's a done deal. What this is kind of a a, a low earth orbit type vehicle. This is this is already dinosaur technology. I'm just going to state that right up front. Um they're already probably way past X100. Um and there's uh, there's no idea what those particular craft look like. Um, I've just been told that there's twice as many X planes as being reported. What about the HJF1, the Hyper Falcon? Do not know. The I SO what, know. what what how about the hypersaur? That was a big one everybody was talking about forever. I'm not a hundred percent sure what, what that is, Jimmy. I'm See, I'm just not a hundred percent sure what that is. See, I'm in I'm knee deep in all of the rumors, man. I'm just that's all <laughs> I do. Oh, okay. Now you said we're way beyond X eighty. The right. the one that we did know about that was being reported on for quite a long time was the X fifty one A wave rider. Do you think that I have heard something about that? Right. And what I would say about that is, and I would lead it back to some of the fraud, waste, and abuse and spending that we've talked about. Now, the timeline might be off here, but I want to just spend a few seconds here on the F 35. Jimmy, we, yes. we have to talk about the F 35 because Absolutely. when we talked about the B 2 stealth bomber and how that thing was so concerned with overpricing and things going out of whack and 
the price just skyrocketing on the B-2 stealth bomber. That's nothing compared to the F-35. The F-35 is the the new poster child for fraud, waste, and abuse. Now, how do we know that? Because 60 Minutes reported, and this is a two-year-old report, that the F-35 is eight years behind schedule and $163 billion over budget, Jimmy. How do you get something $163 billion over budget? How do you do that? Can Lockheed Martin be that inept and you know, not following procurement. No, something else is going on. Right, here. right, right. The answer is a, a, a flat out no. Right. They can't be that incompetent to be that far out of whack. Uh, this thing is still not up and running and operational. There's no telling when they'll get the gun for this thing set up. They said 2019 would be the earliest. And I want to uh, just bring your attention to something that was reported in ECN News. 8414. Here's what they said, quote, I'm sure this comes as no surprise, but the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is expensive, very expensive, so expensive that according to one estimate, the money spent on the program could buy every homeless person in the USA a $600,000 mansion. It's crazy, isn't it, when you think yeah. about it like that? And over the weekend, I saw the press release on the F-35, the first one being rolled out in Italy, right? Did mm -hmm. you see that? Well, I know that we're in too deep now, Jim, Jimmy, to uh, to go back. We've already sunk so much into this program, there's no going back now. Even, even uh, over the fact that when uh, Pierre Spray says that the F-35 could never be a replacement for the A-10 because it can't loiter, it can't turn, it can't take ground fire. So what what could this thing actually do in a low altitude uh, supporting troop operation? Yeah, it's a big question. And when we look at the dumping of this money, it's going somewhere. And mm -hmm. I constantly go back and I want to remind the audience all the time about the X-37B. The X-37B is real. It just, uh, you know, when you think about a two-year two -year mission, what possibly could that plane be up there doing in space for two years? Good question. I don't know. I don't know. Do you, do you think that there is a weaponization uh, of space? Uh, I think we've got assets up there, and we've had assets up there for decades We've got things in low Earth orbit, whether you want to call it a secret space program, because if you've seen the flight characteristics of the Southern Illinois Triangle, there's no reason why those can't be exoatmospheric type vehicles. Do you think with uh, when we reference the secret space program, I'll try to get this uh uh, try to get this in before we have to uh, break. The secret space program is running in parallel with what we are doing now. Do you think that there is something going on uh, on the moon? Do you think that we have been back since Apollo? Uh, they will never acknowledge it, but yes, I think we've been there. Yes, they will never acknowledge it. You'll never get that from an official source. Why do you, why do you think that the 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 next trip to the moon is probably going to be privately funded, right? Or the next trip to Mars is going to be privately funded. Does that tell you that we have that, that that's an impossibility, right? That uh, you're probably be right. It's, it's going to be privately funded, but if they're using liquid rockets, they're already dinosaur technology. So we've already talked about that, that it was developed in 1943 timeframe, uh, during the third Reich. Why are we still using liquid rockets? Um, there it's, it's a, it's a moot point. It's obsolete dinosaur technology. We've already shown in the reference works by mid 1954, 55, they were already cracking the gravity barrier. And according to Ben Rich, Whatever we can imagine, we can do. And when we're going to find out about this technology uh, eventually, do you mm -hmm. think that it is going to be WikiLeaks that is going to expose this? Do you think it's going to be a whistleblower? Nope. Uh, how do you think uh, this will finally go public? Here's the way that it was explained to me via the Leonard Stringfield files. Uh, according to what Gordon Cooper 
our, our fantastic Mercury 7 Gordon Cooper astronaut who's no longer with us, but it was his assessment that the only way, the only way that this will ever break is if the scientific community comes together as a united coalition, and that's the only way it's going to happen. They've got to come together as one unified voice that will pressure and basically go over the heads of the military industrial complex that would be the only way according to gordon cooper that this would ever come out do you think it's oil that's stopping it uh, you know until the oil money runs out that this technology just is not going to you know be commercialized that's kind of touching on what greer had talked about where he talks about the utilities and how it would bankrupt them and that's true to a certain degree but remember they're only interested in essentially one thing, and that is to control the high ground. Because when you control the high ground, you control the world. And the only way to control the high ground is to have these classified aerospace vehicles in a low Earth orbit, a geosynchronous orbit, or up there in space so that you can control that high ground. So, yes, the utilities, oil is part of it, but it, it is that power projection. It is that first strike capability that they're after. And and they've got it. They've got it. I wouldn't worry about any skirmish that we might get involved in. I've been told by uh, Jim Goodall that when you when you hear about something, the, the uh, United States is being threatened. Don't worry about it. We can take care of it. I want to thank you so much, Michael. Great conversation tonight. What's next for you? Are you speaking anywhere? I'm going to be speaking at the Secret Space Program uh, MUFON Symposium in Las Vegas. And what's the date on that? That's July 22nd through the 24th, I believe, All right we- in that time frame. There's mm-hmm. nothing like a good MUFON Symposium in Las Vegas, is there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael, and we'll see you in Las Vegas. And a great conversation tonight. Again, thank you so much. Thanks, Jimmy. Michael Schratt, everybody, he's going to be at the MUFON Symposium at the end of July, and uh, you can just go to uh, MUFON.com and it, or MUFON.org, and all the information is there. Michael Schratt, great conversation tonight. I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be right back for more of your phone calls and also all of the news that you know absolutely nothing about. I'll be right back. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. So you went to dinner last night, you had your favorite pasta. Or maybe you had a heavy, spicy meal and it left you. Get the tea.com. Maybe you mowed down a huge steak and your plumbing is all plugged. Get the tea.com. Our super strength tea will take care of your occasional. It's all organic and non-GMO. Get rid of. We have so many great supplements, but our super tea is number one. Get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com. Levels of power, fact or fiction. Author Mike Gilmore brings political thrillers aligned with the latest news stories direct from our nation's capital. Immigration and border security, high tension in Southeast Asia, a Supreme Court nomination. Follow Senator Randy Fisher through the halls of power as he confronts the issues that affect our everyday lives. Fast-paced political thrillers, levels of power. Discover more at michaelgilmore1.com or amazon.com. Get hooked today when you take the beans from central america with dashes of indonesian and african mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black you create the ultimate brew of fringe introducing the fade to black blend from river moon coffee yes river moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. 
Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. What's up, Fade or Nots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Tappy. Erica, Brittany, Gabby, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. Thank you, Michael Schratt. Man, smart dude. And I, I just want everybody to know, if you go over to the gallery for Michael Schratt there at JimmyChurchRadio.com, all of the illustrations there that we referenced in the show tonight are there. And if you are listening to this in uh, the archives that uh, we will, uh, I think we're going to get everything up in the video for YouTube, but all of everything is always referenced there at JimmyChurchRadio.com. So you can go and, and search Michael Schratt and then click on the gallery. It is there and archived forever. Thank you so much, Michael. Great conversation. <clears throat> and back to my point. Uh, when it comes to Michael, oh, by the way, phone lines are open, both 323-825-5045 or 323-275-9695. Both lines are open. Um, Michael, like uh, Dolan, and I, and I said John Greenwald, too, um, uh, they are the, the voices of of reason when it comes to ufology it's 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 very important uh for us to have uh somebody that that can bring the information forward so i and and know exactly and not speculate just go out there and put it all on the table and that's why michael schratt i mean i i knew this conversation was important now i wanted to say this i didn't do this during the show but uh michael uh walked by rita and i rita uh, so we're uh, at the after party for Greer, and Rita leans forward to me and goes, you know, we got to get Michael Schratt on the show. Right as she says that to me, Michael's walking behind Rita. <laughs> and I just went, he's right there, Schratt. And I yelled out Schratt, and it was rude. Um, I didn't say Michael. I yelled out Schratt in this crowd. Now, he stopped and turned on, came back and sat down. We booked the show and so forth. But... Uh, I just wanted to apologize to Michael for that because it was just loud. It was obnoxious. And I just wanted to make sure that my loud, booming voice cut through the crowd because there was a lot of people there. But uh, looking back in hindsight, it was just completely rude. So, Michael, I apologize for that. But anyway, great conversation tonight. Okay, and he will be speaking at the MUFON Symposium uh, third week of July in Las Vegas. Take us in for or over at MUFON.org. Um, now, talking about, uh, I want to, before I get to the news that you know nothing about, it's very important today when we are talking about uh, so much so out there. I would say 
Oh, probably three years ago, two years ago, as Corey Good started to uh, uh, do his thing and expose the secret space program and what was going on, the 20 years and back program and so forth. Michael Sala had been talking about this for a long time and others, too, as well, the secret space program and what has been going on out there, not only on the moon and Mars, but but throughout our solar system and and throughout history here on on Earth. Right. That um, it it seemed so fantastical. Now, uh, Corey and Michael and others, I'm just, you know, it's just Corey is who I'm thinking about first here, um, has been talking about this for a long time. And uh, the, the number of people out there that are listening to different whistleblowers about the secret space program uh with an open ear right it it is it it has gotten very very large but there are others out there that go man there's no evidence there is no evidence of a secret space program i will pull up two or three maybe four examples of for me that there is something going on the first thing i'm going to point at which is what michael schratt was just talking about is the trillions of missing dollars trillions not bill trillions of missing dollars where is it going yes underground bases certainly tunneling systems absolutely um right now they're tunneling underneath los angeles they had it on the news the core the the tunnel uh uh, machine and and they're talking to the contractor there on the news here in Los Angeles and he goes well yeah you know we just got this back here but we, it went out and it was it was being used in other parts of the country but now it's back here and it's that that famous boring machine that you've seen uh, the pictures on over the net it is right here in Los Angeles right now digging tunnels um, <laughs> that, that's one I don't know how many of these are out there right now around the country around the world that are digging tunnels. But uh, it's an extraordinarily expensive machine. Now, he said on the news here in Los Angeles, it can drill. And this thing is huge, right? It's huge. 100 meters a day. 100 meters a day. Now, if this thing is just boring 24-7, just think about what is underneath the United States that you know nothing about. Going back to the missing trillions of dollars, right? That's one example of the evidence of a secret space program. Uh, The other one for me, which is obvious, is the X-37B in the United States Air Force. This was not supposed to exist. The technology to get this done, get up their orbit for years at a time, this is only what has been declassified. We have no clue about what is actually going on out there. None. None. The the fact that Apollo stopped when it did, and we have not gone past 200, 300, 400 miles past planet Earth since 1974, I'm not buying into Skylab, the, the, the shuttle, right? That's it, the International Space Station. We haven't done anything beyond that since. Where's all the money going? We stopped the shuttle program. There's no money going into that anymore, right? Or is there? Think about that. I I just don't buy into it. And then we have the other side of it. We have the immense amount of disinformation that is piling up on us from all directions. I don't know what I I don't know what to believe or who to trust anymore. And I'm talking about Washington D.C. I'm not talking about our circle of people. I'm talking about Washington, D.C. It's a huge disinfo campaign. The simple fact that when you have one, two, three, four, five, six, ten trillion dollars in missing money and no accountability, the Pentagon hasn't been audited and nobody has come forward and said anything about any of no congressman, no senator, no, no oversight committee has stepped forward and said, where is this money? Nobody. And what does that tell you? It's been spent somewhere. And some of the best, uh, the obvious uh, thing that I can say, secret space program, absolutely. There is money being spent, money that you can't even imagine. Now, uh, another point that Michael Schrapp brought up, you know, just the cost of the F-35, just the cost, 
could put every homeless person in the United States in a $600,000 mansion? Think about that for a second. That's the, uh, the kind of money that we're talking about here that could literally end all of the world's issues right now. And that money is gone. Where did it go? And Congress doesn't want to do anything about it. Nobody has mentioned it. It's it's absolutely crazy. Nuts. Nuts. Um, back to uh, what I had mentioned at the beginning of the show, I'm going to say it here. We need a united front. We don't need the, the backstabbing and, and, and talk. And this guy is right. And this guy is wrong. This, these kinds of conversations going on out there. When I hear people doing that, that says to me that that is disinformation right there, trying to deflect off of the real issues that somebody out here is absolutely wrong. It, it is, it, it, it is bothering me. So everybody that's listening to me right now, all of you fader knots out there, United front, United front. Everybody is right. Everybody is right. We need to listen to everybody. If we stopped and, you know, when we talk about some of the research from the obvious, like Dolan or Linda Moulton Howe, you know, the, the uh, Greer is another great example of this, or Corey Good, or a- anybody that you can mention here. The, the amount of backstabbing and things that have gone on for all of them it's just wrong. I, I'm, I'm, I will not be subject to it. I'm not going to buy into any of it. All right? There you go. There is stuff that is being talked about right now uh, on a few different fronts, and I want all of you just to plain and simply ignore it. Ignore it. All right? And I don't care who it's coming from. You listen to me first. All right. Let's get to all of the news that you know absolutely nothing about. Check this out. New York City. New York City scooped up $993 million in a billion dollars in fines, fines in 2016, driven by a spike in quality of life violations. Listen to this. (laughs) A billion dollars. The fines show a 22% increase in revenue since 2016 can you say cash cow right they figured something out in new york total fines collected in fiscal year 2016 jumped to 93 993 million dollars a 3.7 percent rise on 957 million dollars collected from the year before and the third record year in a row city officials handed out nearly 700,000 quality of life fines in 2016. That's for a total of $184 million in fines, representing a growth of 51% since 2013. These include violations such as littering, noise pollution, sidewalk violations, and public health and safety violations. I'm not making this up. Two-thirds of those tickets came from the Department of Sanitation for improper waste disposal, dirty sidewalks, and other trash and public cleanliness infractions. Parking tickets and traffic violations are the lead revenue generator for fines, where city officials issue between $9 million and 11 million tickets in a given year and account for 55% of all fines for a total of $545 million. Are you listening to me now? um, After this uh, got released uh, here in Los Angeles, (laughs) there was uh, a cop. uh, I believe he just got fired. I'm not going to say his name. uh, Got caught in downtown L.A., going up to parking meters and erasing the time on the meters. Now, I didn't even know that this was possible. And as it turns out, it is, right? They can go up to a parking meter that you have just put cash in and erase the time on the parking meter and then turn around and issue you a ticket. But but what happened here was the guy got caught. 
the the person whose car was there went out to put some extra money in the meter, caught the cop. There was 55 minutes left on the meter, something like that, 54 minutes left on the meter. He just wanted to pump another hour into it and saw the cop witness, and I believe videotaped the cop erasing it down to zero and cutting him a parking ticket. He got caught and turned in. Now that cop is unemployed. Now think about this for a second. How many times, and th- that's here in Los Angeles, it, it could be citywide. Think about what I just told you about, and this is the conspiracy, right? Think about this going down in New York. You lose track of time. You don't know what's going on. Did I have two hours left? Did I have an hour left? I better run out. Boom, you go out. Your car's at zero, and you got a traffic ticket. And you're trying to remember what went on. And what do you do? You just pay the ticket, right? Think about it the conspiracy of making a billion dollars in New York. It's going down here in Los Angeles. I'm just saying, think about that for a second. Now, got to talk about Bitcoin because the world's most popular cryptocurrency continues to set historic highs over the last week. Last week, Bitcoin cracked the $1,500 barrier. It happened last Thursday. Bitcoin was trading at $1,515 against the U.S. dollar. And now that retreated off of the day's high of $1,544.43. And this is according to the Coindex uh, price index. The digital currency has gained more than 32% in the last two weeks. The rally has been credited to growing global demand led by Japan, which recently authorized digital currencies as legal payment methods and its BitFlyer Bitcoin exchange. 32% increase in two weeks. What would you say if gold did that? What would you say if the stock market did that? We're talking about get Bitcoin a digital currency. There are movements going on right now in Washington to actually make Bitcoin legal currency and to start to track it. Now, is it because the government uh, uh, wants to be able to start taxing Bitcoin? Right. They want to be able to track it. Right. Now, we have the whole anonymous side of Bitcoin. The the ties to Bitcoin, I've talked about this uh, over the years, trying to uh, create an image of Bitcoin that is, you know, it's for drug dealing and drug trafficking and and porn sites and Tor and the deep web and and it's cryptocurrency and it's 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 untraceable. And is this is this now Washington's way of getting in on the action? And will they be able to eventually trace some of these transactions? It's a big question. One, two, let's not forget, Tor was created by the, the United States government. The whole anon, uh, anonymity behind Tor, um, is it a facade? Is there a way to actually trace and track um, not only the users on the web, but the transactions that are going on? Not where you go and surf, there's that, but also the transactions. I think there's something behind all of this. Um, the darkness that has been painted on Bitcoin over the years, again, it's just a currency used by criminals, to now going mainstream and being tied into Tor directly. It's going to be interesting. Uh, will Bitcoin, if if it does go to ATM machines and, and transactions when you order your Domino's pizza, will, will the ability to track Bitcoin at that point be able to uh be used to track all transactions of bitcoin and the entire anonymous part of it disappears think about that i do believe there's something behind this more on this there's no way as as its value increases and and more and more uh transactions will be allowed and it becomes an actual legitimate authorized currency it's not going to be the same the party may be over for Bitcoin. Now, over to North Korea. Got to talk about this for a second because North Korea over the weekend warned China of grave consequences. That's right. It's best friend. And it's, uh, it's only friend in the world, North Korea. A little bit with Russia, but 
or uh, China. North Korea said there will be grave consequences if it chops down relations between the two countries. And despite the angry outburst, Beijing is trying to chill them out and says it wants to maintain friendly relations with its southern neighbor. In a commentary late uh, last week, uh, which was a Friday, North Korean state news agency KCNA took aim, and I'm quoting here, at a string of absurd and reckless remarks, end quote, from Chinese media toward Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions. I'm quoting, the DPRK will never beg for maintenance of friendship with China. Wow. Risking its nuclear program, which it is as precious as its own life. No matter how valuable the friendship is, China should no longer try to test the limits of the DPRK's patience. They continue. China better had ponder over the grave consequences to be entailed by its reckless act of chopping down the pillar of the DPRK China relations. End quote. Wow. The, the, the only friend you have in the world. The rhetoric has always been at the United States. A little bit of China, a little bit at South Korea, right? Now China is the focus of North Korea's talk. Absolutely crazy. I, 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 now, I have, I have a feeling that on the inside, China has told North Korea to chill out. I had said last week, and I said it the week before, there's a reason why the latest nuclear test hasn't happened. For some reason, it's over. Right? Now, will there be a sixth nuclear test? Okay. If, if there is one, will there be a reaction from Trump this time out? I have the feeling that China thinks that there will be something crazy going off. China does not want this on their border. I can tell you right now, they don't want, they don't want to have war break out. If that war breaks out, are we in a proxy war with China, or does China side with us, right, and, and, and get Kim Young fatty fat out? I don't know. But in other North Korean news, because this is what is interesting— the House overwhelmingly voted last Thursday to impose new sanctions on North Korea amid all of these tensions over the nuclear and ballistic missile programs and testing. The vote was 419 to 1, and you have not heard about this in the mainstream news. I'm reporting it to you here. The vote was 419 to 1, targets North Korea's shipping industry and the use of slave labor. Now listen to me. It requires that the Trump administration report to Congress within 90 days on whether North Korea should be reinstated on the government state sponsors of the terror list. Such a designation would trigger more sanctions, including restriction on U.S. foreign assistance. I thought there was nothing left from us. I didn't think that there was anything left existing. And to have 90 days uh, out on more sanctions doesn't make any sense. I didn't think anything was left. Listen to this. Specifically, the bar, the bill bars ships owned by North Korea or by countries that refuse to comply with U.N. resolutions against it from operating in American waters or docking at U.S. ports. Now, what this says to me is, North Korean ships are currently docking in U.S. ports, that we are importing goods from North Korea that aren't manufactured by slave labor. Isn't it all slave labor? The last plant that was there, the joint cell South Korea, um, uh, North Korea plant, that's been shut down for two years. So what is the goods that we are importing from North Korea, right? Think about this. Goods produced by North Korea's forced labor would be prohibited from entering the United States. That's the vote at 419 to 1. But flip this over 180 degrees and look at the backside of this. What this is saying is that the sanctions would be put in place to block the forced labor goods that are currently being imported into the United States. Did you know about this? I didn't. 
It doesn't make any sense, does it? You got to love Washington. Are there right now ships from North Korea pulling into the United States? Goods are being brought off of these ships and sold here inside of the United States that have been manufactured by slave labor in North Korea. And that if they do another missile test, if they do another nuclear test, that we're going to stop those ships from getting here. Well, that's what the bill proposes. 419 to 1. And I'm telling you, you didn't know anything about it. Think about that for a second. All right, really quick. <laughs> I've got to uh, I got to get these two stories in because they're crazy. I got two minutes left. Two statistics students at the University of Kentucky are now facing the consequences for making a really huge miscalculation during finals week. Why? Well, police hit Henry Lynch II and Troy Kipthuth, both 21, with third-degree burglary charges last Wednesday after they allegedly crawled through an air duct to steal an exam from a professor's office. Instructor John Kane said that he had been working late in his office uh, in the science building last Tuesday when he left to get something to eat. He returned around 1.30 a.m., but his door was blocked and he couldn't get in. He yelled out that he was calling the the police and then the door swung open and the two students ran down the hallway lynch who was in kane's class later returned and confessed to police that he had crawled through the building's air ducts to drop down into the office then he admitted to doing the same thing a couple of months before in the semester there you go air ducts dropped in that's it's just too funny anyway the ongoing case has been referred to the fayette county circuit court all right 30 seconds here you go sit down and enjoy this the city of chicago has approved a plan to block trump's name on his tower with giant flying golden pigs Architect Jeffrey Roberts first came up with the idea for flying pigs on parade. The possibility that Donald Trump would clinch the presidency seemed like, well, when a fig, when pigs fly type of situation. The phrase has taken on a whole new meaning now that the plan to cover up Trump's name on his Chicago hotel with flying golden pigs is officially seriously for real. It's going to happen. The 20 foot tall Trump sign will be covered up with four floating 20 foot tall golden pigs. And this is fade to black. I want to thank Michael Schratt for an absolutely amazing conversation tonight. Thank you to everybody that called in. Thank you for the email. Thank you for all the tweets. Faded Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Paul, Mark D. Kovar, LJ3, Renee, Jonas. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Fady by Dale. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldridge. Intro, Spaceboy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication, KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2017 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Tomorrow night, right here, Peter Lavenda, the 100th anniversary of Fatima. Until tomorrow night, everybody be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.